Good evening, everyone. I hereby call to order the Palm Springs regular City Council meeting of November 28, 2022. Uh, First order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, and this evening we are joined by Troop 262 that will lead us through the Pledge of Allegiance. I invite everyone to stand and the troop to come forward. Uh, City Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Hostich. Here. Councilmember Coors. Here. Councilmember Woods. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Here. Mayor Middleton. Present. Five members present. Okay. And we have no presentations this evening, is that correct? All right, That's correct. You. So the next item is acceptance of the agenda. The City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order of agenda, the agenda, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items, <coughs> excuse me, or request consent calendar items to be removed for a separate discussion. I would like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda. Are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion or vote? I do have a request that item 3C be moved to the last item uh, and item 3D be moved in advance of item 3C. Are there any consent items or other changes to uh, the agenda? Okay, thank you. Mayor? Um, pulling consent, yes. Oh, motion? No, I want to pull item... 1G, I believe. So which is the one with the purchasing consortium? Do we know off the top of your head? My tag fell off. Okay. Sorry. That would be 1F. F. Okay. Thank you. So 1F, Mayor. Okay. So item 1F. Has been pulled by Council Member Coors. Any other items to be pulled? With that, can I get a motion? Uh, we need to do it verbally. Second? A second. All right. Motion and second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Hostage? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Council Member Coors? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Five eyes, motion passes. All right. At this time, I'd, next uh, item is a report of closed session, and I invite City Attorney Ballinger to provide a report on closed session, and Mr. Ballinger is observing uh, COVID uh, precautions and will not be present in the room with us this evening. 
Yes, Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members and members of the public. The City Council did meet in closed session earlier tonight to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. There was no reportable action. However, uh, the City wishes the public to be aware that uh, on the item involving real property negotiations, uh, the, the one item that had a number of real property uh, descriptions and addresses, that item uh, came about as a result of the city's uh, requirement under state law to bring forward an inventory list of all of its properties, which the city will be doing at the December 5th meeting uh, next week. And so uh, the closed session was really a preliminary uh, step to that legally required process. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, the next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address City Council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comments for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. City Clerk, please begin. Our first public speaker is Michael Horn. Mr. Horn, you have two minutes. Honorable Mayor Middleton, and fellow council members. My name is Michael John Horn. I have a Palm Springs home and a business owner in Los Angeles. I'm before you tonight to support the proposed changes to Municipal Code 5.77 pertaining to the adult-oriented businesses. I have operated over the last 22 years an adult business in Los Angeles and it's been successful. It's, called, it's an adult-oriented men's club in the area of Silver Lake. Um, when I started this club, I was working with Chief Bernard Parks of LAPD on a gay and lesbian task force to stop the uh, violence in Silver Lake on patrons coming out of bars. So as a result, I had connections into the police department, and there were a number of operating businesses that did not have licenses in the area, and these were adult businesses. And so I, uh, I realized that maybe there was a need for a, a, a legal club somewhere near Silver Lake. And so I asked a detective in the LAPD and uh, a building and safety inspector to help me find that building. I found it. It was 550 feet from a school, um, and I managed to get the club open. Um, now, currently, I'm surrounded by schools, but my business is there uh, grandfathered in. Um, I've worked with the health department in Los Angeles to address various issues, sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, monkeypox, we had vaccination sites in our parking lot. And uh, so I, uh, I have a building here at 541 East Industrial Place. It's- Your it, time has expired. A, I'm sorry? Your time has expired. Oh, okay. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. Next speaker is John McBain, followed by Dean Levine. Mr. McBain, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is John McBain. I am a small business owner here in Palm Springs. I'm speaking today in support of um, 3B. My business is not currently regulated by this ordinance, but I feel it's imp important to show the support. I feel we need to be proactive in our efforts to update our city charter. I also do not feel it is necessary to have additional laws on the books that are stricter than state law that appear to be working. I believe staying up with the times is important for the growth and inclusivity of our city. And I encourage the city council to support this change as written and pass it for our city. Thank you. Next speaker is Dean Levine, followed by William Fryer. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, hi again. 
Um, just con calling about the uh, street sidewalk vending ordinance that you guys have before you today. Um, just wanted to give you a little sense of what it's like for those of us who are business owners, brick and mortar. Um, the spirit of the law from the state makes sense and why it's there. However, um, what it also does is it, it, we are not, we don't have to go through, we have to go through so much more than what a sidewalk vendor would have to do. Currently, there's a new sidewalk vendor in our district. Um, the vending gets bigger, the signage is there, there's uh, smoke that comes from the uh, charcoal that infiltrates all of the parklet and the, the uh, inside of our restaurant. Um, they don't have to go through the same rules that we do. I currently pay $1.85 uh, a square foot a month for a parklet, um, and they're catty corner from us, and they don't have to pay anything. In that parklet, we have strong rules that we've actually worked through with the city on that we have to follow through on in terms of um, uh, what we can do legally, uh, aesthetically, what the parklet looks like, what we have. Uh, so I urge you guys to adopt the ordinance. I urge you guys to see what you can do in terms of making sure that it's equitable to the rest of us in our city. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker is William Fryer, followed by Michael Pitkin. Hello, uh, City Council. Thank you very much uh, for uh, letting us get up here this night. Um, on the 3B issue also, I'm in favor of this. Uh, I like the expansion of the amount of space that we could actually have in our stores. Um, it, I've had to, to, I think it's 10% or 20% of the store right now, and I can add another 10% to that, so that helps me a lot. I uh, own Not So Innocent uh, next to Two Cans Bar, and we're a very upscale place, and we never have any problems with the law. And I'm looking forward to actually being able to grow a little bit better because of this. So I, I definitely uh, support this uh, bill. So thank you. Michael Picken. This is for number L and three A and B. Michael Joseph Pitkin. My experience, Palm Spring labels all unhoused as drug addicts. Tobacco is considered a coping mechanism adopted by the LGBTQ community due to discrimination. The community also cope by using drugs and sex. Human companionship and touch is vital to survival for each and every one of us. A sex positive environment and harm reduction combat stigma and shame. Harm reduction programs should have federal protections under public health and physician care without fear of arrest or retaliation. People who hate crime against the LGBT are the addicts. They get a high off of causing fear. According to the Fight Magazine, U.S. Supreme Court 2003 ruling invalidated sodomy laws nationwide. Yet many states still label individuals sex offenders, persecuting LGBTQ individuals, subjecting them to intrusion, punishment, and public humiliation for the crime of having same-sex relations. More so for black, indigenous, and people of color and those with intersecting identities. President Biden signed executive order preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. U.S. Congress Equality Act ensures LGBTQ individuals and families cannot be denied housing, employment, <coughs> education, credit because of who they are or who they love. This includes transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people. In 1980, Boise, Idaho, at the Oli, a gay bar, you could pick up a HRSA CDC safe sex flyer 50 years later you can still pick up that same flyer with the same antiquated message. Today, I protest limited HIV and STI cure allocations in the last 50 years. I have been involved in the HIV commissions of Oregon, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Idaho, Reno, and Las Vegas. None allocated funding for STI cure research. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Online, we have joining us Bruce Hoban.
I'm here. Hold one second. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm speaking on item 3A. I'm Bruce Hoban, uh, one of the co-founders of Leapon. As Mayor Middleton has often stated, good legislation is when all parties are not 100% happy. So Mayor Middleton, that would normally be true, but the city got rid of vacation rental parties in 2017. There are no parties. I know, I know. That's a really bad pun play on the word parties. Blame my father. It's genetic. Tonight you are voting to enact new restrictions or concepts, several of which are, again, probably the first in the state or country that V. Iran is aware of. It's now V. Iran's, the hospitality and the real estate community's obligation to closely watch the impacts. Maybe some, maybe none. To monitor the impacts, though, will require the Office of Special Program Compliance to immediately start implementing new types of collection information and reports. Luckily, they have upgraded their database and their software and should be able to do this. For example, neighborhoods at a 20% density limit. The realtors need to know every week where those limits are so they can tell their buyers. Are there any changes in property values of those neighborhoods? Uh, junior permits, will they have a higher or lower complaint calls or citations? We will submit reasonable suggestions to the city for reporting and at $1,000 per year for a full permit, the city has the funding from our permit fees. So our goal is to ask for reports and get the support of the new incoming city council to support this so we can monitor these effects over the years. Thank you. Next speaker is Frank Tyson. Frank Tyson. Um, this is a phone in uh, uh, phone call, so he may be having trouble with the with the phone service. Okay. The next speaker is Juan Espinoza. Good evening, Council. My name is Juan Espinoza. I'm a civil rights lawyer and equal justice works fellow at Public Council. I'm here speaking on item three C. I work in support of small businesses and sidewalk vendors, worked on statewide legislation, supporting improvements to the permitting system for vendors. And I wanted to speak today on the proposed ordinance and ask and respectfully request that there be further research and support and involvement of the community in drafting the ordinance and that there be a tabling of the ordinance until the ordinance is actually in compliance with the state law, SB 946, and also with the upcoming uh, new implementation of the state law, SB 972. The current proposed ordinance currently has overly restrictive times that are discriminatory to these small businesses when compared to other locate businesses located nearby. The ordinance also has recommendations of scan policies and background checks that aren't necessarily a requirement for all businesses and therefore discriminatory as well. Uh, there are a number of other provisions such as a possible encroachment permit which is about $1,700 for the cost of the permit. This is for a population that makes roughly fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year and, and therefore I, I ask that the City Council take more time to consider the provisions in the currently uh, drafted ordinance and take out. more time to make sure that the impetus behind this ordinance is actually there to support a community that is enlivening our communities, a community that enriches not just in economic terms, but in cultural terms, in safety and welfare for all of our communities. The city of Palm Springs can do so much better than the ordinance as proposed now. Thank you. Next speaker is Dan Aharon. Dang. Mayor, City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I wanted to raise your attention to a change that is proposed in the ordinance regarding 
um, how couples are treated with the short-term rental uh, ordinance change. Um, the current proposed change creates a situation where married couples are discriminated against versus regular unmarried couples. Uh, my husband went and bought a house in Palm Springs after I bought mine and followed everything in the ordinance to make sure that he's in compliance. We both heavily invested in each of our houses and spent a lot of resources in the local economy, uh, which um, you know we're, we're very excited about. We, lo we love Palm Springs. If the proposed rule goes through, um, we may need to get divorced in order to comply with the law, or my husband may need to sell his house at a huge loss at this point, which could be hundreds of thousands or millions. Uh, we strongly request you to have further public discussion about this proposed change, which we believe is unfair and immoral, and as I've been told, may even be unconstitutional. We ask that you remove it from the proposed ordinance until there's an opportunity to have such a public discussion. If you decide to move forward anyway, um, I beg you to at least exempt current permit holders from this rule. The Office of Special Compliance told us that this was the intention all along, but we'd sleep much better at night knowing that it's addressed formally. This could be easily done. The, the following paragraph right after it mentions that ownership requirements only apply to new permit holders from, 2000, from 2017 onwards. Um, so you could uh, clarify that this rule change uh, that you're now making also only applies to permits from 2023 onwards to protect existing homeowners that are already otherwise fully complying with the city's ordinance. Thank you for listening. The next speaker is John Shea. You have two minutes, John. Good evening, Council Mayor. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the restaurant industry and businesses in general in Palm Springs. Um, you know, speaking, we have Lulu's and we're one of the main restaurants in, in the city. We're not afraid of competition, but we would like a level playing field. So the regulations should equalize the playing field. Uh, we have no issues if small businesses want to get a head start and, and start their business. But from what I understand, a lot of these vendors are big out of town uh, businesses that are putting employees. So th that's no different than us opening up businesses without licenses. So I appreciate the council taking a look at this and putting regulations in place so that levels the playing field for all of us. Thank you. John spoke already. That's the last speaker. All right. Did, uh, was there another attempt to reach Mr. Tyson? He, he left. He came back in and then he left. All right. So Thank we don't you. have a Next item is the consent calendar. I will entertain a motion uh, to accept the consent calendar without item 1F, which was removed for separate discussion. Do we have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Councilmember Woods, yes. Mayor Milton. Aye. Five ayes, zero noes, motion passes. All right, so item 1F was removed for separate discussion. Uh, staff report, please. Council, I'm Kim Baker, um, purchasing and contracting uh, and manager we're, for the city. You want me just to explain yeah, my question? We, that might be yes, easier. I'm happy to please. help. Yeah, and I know we've discussed this um, issue in the past when we're doing business with entities and states that ban um, things that aren't allowed under our equal benefit ordinance like gender affirming care as in the case of Florida. Um, and so I thought one of the things we talked about, we might want uh, our city attorney on for this, was in when we have those situations, you know, getting more from the business. So if they don't offer health insurance, they're not in violation of our, non, our equal benefits law. But if they do, and the care can't be provided in Florida, they would be. So I think we don't have that information here, which is why I pulled this. So currently they sign a non-discrimination certification that states that they're not gonna do any of those things, that they're not gonna discriminate in any way, shape, or form. So I guess 
um, as staff, what we need to understand is what more do we need to get right. from them? Like what kind of proof do we need to obtain from them? And is it, is there a list of states that we need to do that with? Is it? Yes. Yes. You know, and yes. You know, so I, I think what I, we talked, I think what we talked about probably even before you, you might've even been here, but, yes. um, was, uh, Obviously, if it's in California, there are no issues, right? California mm -hmm. already has the same law we do, um, right. exactly the same. But in states where we know, for example, that health policies would not be able to provide equal benefits, we would want to then see their health insurance and see what, right? Because if they don't provide any benef health benefits, there's no issue. But if they do provide health benefits and they're not allowing these treatments for people purely based on gender identity, right, as opposed to for um, gender identity-related reasons, that's illegal for us to contract with them under our own ordinance. So I think we can get you a list um, of states where, you know, we have uh, these anti-LGBT laws, primarily targeting transgender youth is the bulk of them. Um, and in that case, we'd probably want to check their health insurance, right? Um, if there are other issues that come up, we'd want to check in those states. Uh, so in, I, I guess, what signing, oh, sorry, I no, was going to say, gonna say you know, signing something, you know, some cities like San Francisco, they have to send every, they have to send every one of their employment policies. We don't want to do that. So right. we were doing it on trust, but if we know the state doesn't allow it, I think is when we need to do a little more digging. And what I was going to say is, you know, like all the employees we deal with are here, they live here in right. Southern California. So we often don't think about them as being from somewhere else. They're headquartered in Florida, you're correct, but all the employees we deal with live in Southern California. So, okay. So if I could expand on that, uh, certainly uh, gender confirming care and gender identity care is, uh, is an issue in many locations. We also have uh, many states that uh, uh, do not provide uh, for full reproductive uh, care. Uh, we have states for which uh, abortions have been banned. Uh, and we have employers in many of those states that have made it clear that they will provide transportation free of charge to their employees so that they can access care that is prohibited in the states that they are in. I, at minimum, want to know whether or not uh, and someone we're contracting with uh, makes uh, transportation and health care available uh, to their employees so that they can, and families so that they can seek care uh, that uh, we in California have made abundantly clear is a part of a fully inclusive, non-discriminatory uh, uh, health care package. And uh, yeah, so, and I think there are two different issues, um, as the city attorney advised me today. So one is what our current law requires, which is if the benefits offered to anyone, it has to be offered, right, um, to everyone, including for, uh, gender identity related um, care. Then there's whether we want to require contractors um, to provide health insurance, whether we want to include that health insurance to include um, uh, abortion care, which would be a separate ordinance, which we could ask to have brought back. Um, so I think those are, they're related. So I just wanted to point out that's something that probably we, we can request to bring, bring back Agreed. as well. Yeah. Agree. That's right, but something I think we that need, we need to consider. We need a new ordinance, I think, is what is that correct for that part? Yes. Yep. But you believe we can do that as well? I believe, yes, based on the research that we've done, I believe that's something yep. that's within the authority of the council. Yes. So I support your idea, though. <laughs> and we appreciate the predicament that uh, you're in in trying to uh, efficiently uh, contract uh, for services. Uh, and it is, is unfortunate uh, that uh, many of our colleagues in other states have chosen a course uh, that does not provide full uh, undiscriminatory care to all of their residents. 
And so just so you guys know what's happening with this is we've been using Office Depot ODC for a long time. So we are bringing it forward to make it more transparent with what we're doing um, and actually start issuing purchase orders for these supplies. Right now they go through a claim voucher process. Um, and so we're just trying to make it a lot more transparent to you know the fact that these purchases have been going on for quite a while and make it um, you know at, to have an actual contract in place and purchase orders in place so that it's, it's a lot more transparent to the public and to the council what we're spending for these office supplies and that's why we're here today with this item. Uh, uh, any other comments? Yeah, just a suggestion uh, for the city manager, um, and I don't know if we can do it at our next meeting or not, but sort of to actually agendize what kind of guidance, right? If all the employees working on the contract live in California, would that be allowed, right? Things, so maybe we just have that as a discussion item so we can give that kind of guidance, you know. Yeah, we can come back with some clarification. With it on the agenda, because I know we can't give agenda. too much. Too much and guidance. Now we can, uh, okay. so maybe continue this one until next. And with this one, can we do what we have done with the previous ones? We have the city attorney um, call and contact the corporate headquarters in regard to this specific question to keep this particular item moving, or would that be acceptable in the interim? To me. If everyone council is fine with that. Okay. Thank you. So, so is there a motion? Uh, so what would you like the motion to be? I think there was a motion to um, move this to the next agenda, and then we will also agendize in the future some discussion on this policy that we right. need to create in the ordinance. Right. And ask the city attorney to contact the corporate headquarters before our next meeting. Correct. Okay, so moved. Thank you for stating that. And is there a second? A second. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Coors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Councilmember Hostage? Yes. Councilmember Woods? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Uh, five ayes, zero noes. Motion passes. Madam Mayor, um, Frank Tyson is back on the line if you'd like to take his public comments. Certainly. Okay. So if you could bring Frank Tyson. You have two minutes, Mr. Tyson. Okay, this is Frank Tyson. Uh, I am uh, deeply concerned about the sexual business rules changes. Uh, first of all, I want to point out I'm not a prude. For many years, I was a member of Elysian Fields, the nudist colony in Topanga. But I also was the owner of Casa Cody, a boutique hotel. And I have heart, fought hard for the Palm Springs brand of unique quality tourism for many years. I am concerned about this proposal. It looks like you're trying to introduce sex tourism here. And this is not a Sodom and Gomorrah, and we might as well call this town, otherwise Bangkok. It needs more time and community involvement. It also seems inappropriate for an outgoing council to deal with something so game-changing. I urge you to leave it up to the new council if you care about this town. Thank you. Right, thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, we will now move on to the next item, 2A, a public hearing to conduct a special election, an introduction of an ordinance authorizing the levy of special taxes with annexation number 26 to Community Facilities District number 2005-1, Public Safety Services. May we have a staff report, please? Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Joel Montalvo, City Engineer. Uh, so the City Council created Community Facilities District 2005-1 to allow the city to levy a special tax on certain properties that identified as fee status. Non-Indian Alati leased or tribal trust properties located within the city to provide a financing mechanism to sustain the delivery of public safety services to new residential developments located on those properties. Um, as new re residential developments on fee status lands have been approved by the city, they are conditionally approved with a requirement to annex into CFD 2005-1. At this time, one residential development approved on fee status land is recommended for annexation into CFD 2005-1. 
Annexation number 26, track map number 37935, a residential development consisting of 45 multi condominiums, multi family condominiums located at 200 North Gallardo Drive. The City Council previously adopted a resolution declaring its intention to annex this property into CFD 2005 1 and also scheduled today's public hearing on the proposed annexation. That concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Are there questions for staff? Seeing no questions, City Clerk, do we have any registered speakers? We have no registered speakers. Thank you. Public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from Council? There being no questions, City Clerk, please conduct the election. Mayor Milton and City Council, after counting the ballots and canvassing the election, the authorized representatives of the respective landowners entitled to vote have voted yes to authorize the proposed annexation. Okay. City Clerk, uh, I believe you have an announcement then that you need to read. Yeah, we just need to take a vote, Mayor. Do we need a uh, roll call vote? Yes. Okay, roll call vote, please. Or Councilman Hostage. I think we need a motion, right? I think we need a motion Thank first. Thank you. I'll move to approve. And a second. I'll second. The mayor pro tem, it looks like. Go ahead. Doesn't matter. Councilman Coolidge, second. Council Member Hostage? Yes. Council Member Coors? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor pro tem Garner? Yes. Mayor Milton? Aye. Five ayes, zero noes. Motion passes. In the title. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs authorizing the levy of special taxes in a community facilities district, including certain annexation territory identified as annexation number 26, track map number 37935, into community facilities district number 2005 1, public safety services. Thank you. Next item is 2B, a public hearing to request amendments to the Palm Springs Zoning Code Chapter 92-00 related to zoning regulations for child care uses, case number 5.1566CTA. May we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council, a while back, you gave us direction to look at how we could reduce barriers to the establishment of child care businesses. What we are proposing this evening is a modification to the city's zoning code to help facilitate the establishment of child care businesses. In terms of looking at how we could reduce barriers, we looked at two different options. Uh, number one was a fiscal option in terms of doing some type of an application fee waiver. And then the second way was to either reduce or eliminate entitlement application requirements. Uh, and so we investigated those two options. Uh, both have pluses and minuses. In terms of an application fee waiver, um, it would require annual funding from the city's general fund to fund the program. And sometimes in some of the future years, uh, that funding can get lost. And so that's one of the drawbacks of taking that approach. Also, the application fee waiver doesn't shorten the application process timeline. So applicants would still have to file a land use permit or a conditional use permit and go through a process to have that approved by either staff or the Planning Commission. However, one of the benefits of that process is it still allows for either staff or Planning Commission review if there are any impacts of the child care business to adjacent properties. 
The other option is to reduce uh, entitlement application requirements. So to either eliminate or downgrade the application that's needed. Uh, what that does is number one, it eliminates application fees. It doesn't need to be funded from the city's general fund. It also reduces the time frame for approvals. Uh, in most cases, uh, the city would not be required to approve an application. It would only rely on the state to approve applications. In certain cases, we can require a business permit, but that's about the extent of the process. Uh, one of the drawbacks, however, is that it does rely on the state to vet child care businesses. Uh, but that process is rather thorough. And so we can recommend this option to you as the state will do its job in uh, ascertaining that these businesses are operated in a safe manner. So before we get into the specific changes that we're proposing, it's important to understand the three different categories of child care businesses as defined in state law and as we have replicated in our zoning ordinance. The first two categories, daycare small and daycare large, uh, take place in a residence. Uh, typically, the operator of the business has their own children as part of the daycare business, as well as other children. A uh, small facility is eight or fewer children, and then a large daycare facility is nine to 14 children. The third category of a child care business has no limit on the number of children other than the facility capacity as determined by the state. Uh, typically, it is not in a family home, uh, and therefore, you don't often see them in residential zone districts. What we are proposing as part of this change to the zoning code is in residential districts for a child care center, and again, this is one that's typically not in a family home, is to downgrade the application from a conditional use permit to a land use permit. What that does is it substantially reduces the cost and also substantially reduces the time frame for approval. Land use permits are approved at a staff level, and so those can be done in a matter of weeks. As far as daycare small and daycare large in residential zone districts, across the board, those would be permitted uses in residential districts. Uh, that is mostly the case. Currently, uh, there's two instances in the daycare large facility where we are changing that or adding that to a residential zone district. In commercial and industrial zone districts, the only child, child care facility that we allow currently is the child care center. And so this is the larger facility uh, that wouldn't be in a family home. What we're proposing here is to eliminate the requirement for either a conditional use permit or a land use permit and make those permitted uses in commercial districts. And so what that does, it eliminates fees, eliminates a review process. Just to give you an idea in terms of the reduction of fees, a land use permit is currently about $1,600. A conditional use permit is about $7,700. <clears throat> and so that's a substantial savings uh, to operators of those businesses. So with that, what we're proposing is to modify the zoning requirements for child care businesses as a means to reduce barriers uh, that concludes my presentation. We'd be happy to take your questions. Are there questions for staff? Uh, seeing none, uh, at this time I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. Madam Clerk, are there any public uh, requests to speak? We have no public commenters. All right. Public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council? Council Member Woods. Uh, uh, thank you, Flynn. Um, if we go with the state, um, instead of the city implementing the um, process, do they still notify neighbors and things of that nature like the city would, or do they not do that? No, I don't believe that they would notify neighbors. And do you have a, um, a recommendation from a staff standpoint on which 
process you think would be the best? I, I think making changes to our zoning code would be the best approach rather than a fee waiver. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from staff, or excuse me, from city council? Council Member Holstitch. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to applaud staff and the Planning Commission for bringing this forward. Thank you so much for your work on this. Um, this came to our attention because we had a local child care provider who was potentially being pushed out of their current <clears throat> lease where they currently rent, um, and they couldn't find any other location in the city of Palm Springs to continue their business. And so then they were considering having to do a CUP process, which was, as you can see, overly burdensome and expensive um, and just complicated, and then looking at an LUP at different process, different places around town. So uh, Lauren Wolfler on my team, um, who's a council fellow, um, worked with that provider uh, for months, and I know staff did as well. Thank you for the planning department um, for working with them to try to see what we could do, and I even offered to waive the fee or pay for the fee out of my council contingency fund, um, and we didn't have a council process or policy on the books to be able to do that, um, but we saw that there are problems with um, finding enough spaces to locate your child care business and then also going through the administrative process and procedures and paying for the cost of doing a conditional use or a LUP, um, different permits that they might be required to do um, by, city, by the city. So thank you. I think this is excellent work. Really appreciate you bringing, for, bringing this forward. Forward. By the way, for that story, there is good news. They actually stayed in their current location and their landlord was able to um, keep them in. Um, and so that's good, but we don't know how many more businesses could be locating here but cannot find space. I've been working with at least a handful of them um, who can't find current leases and lease space for child care centers. Um, and personally, having looked at child care in other cities, um, it's much more available in some cities than here. We are really, truly are a child care desert. So I'm glad that we're addressing this. Um, so just to be clear from staff, so you you said it as an either or. So you said <laughs> either amend the zoning code, which we have in front of us, to reduce the barriers and to allow some by right and to allow some by LUP instead of conditional use permit. Um, and then you had also sort of um, went over quickly the possibility of reducing fees or waiving fees. So could you talk a little bit about that possibility and why it's an either an or and a not? not a both. As you can see from our staff report, we have recommended the approach to eliminating zoning barriers. Uh, again, one of the reasons why we had recommended that is it, it, it makes it easier from a fiscal standpoint on the city's part that we don't have to continually add money to the budget each year to fund the program, not knowing how many applicants we would get over the course of the year. And sometimes future councils may not be as attuned to the need for child care facilities, and so they may not fund the program. So the other approach is to amend our zoning ordinance to eliminate the need for a conditional use permit or a land use permit and allowing child care businesses as a permitted use. What that does is for the foreseeable future, uh, it does reduce the barriers by not having applicants go through a permit process. They don't have to pay fees. Um, and yet one of the benefits, uh, I learned a whole lot about the permitting process at the state level. Uh, the state is very thorough in terms of how they vet facilities. And so I'm very comfortable in allowing the state to approve childcare businesses and don't feel that it's something that we need to do at the local level with the degree of scrutiny that the state gives each operation. Thank you. And could you just explain, especially for the public, for people who might be listening in, who might be a provider, the difference in the level of review with a land use permit? And so you explain the differences. The conditional use permit costs $7,700. Um, this land use application would cost 1600 or so. What is the review that goes into the LUP that we would still require for child care centers? S certainly. So for a land use permit, as you've indicated, the cost is approximately $1,600. Uh, the application is reviewed at a staff level. So members of the planning staff would review the application, uh, verify that it conforms with zoning requirements, 
uh, verify if there are any impacts, and then would approve the application at a staff level. Uh, as I had mentioned, the time frame for reviewing land use permits is uh, fairly short, anywhere from about two to three weeks, depending on the application and the completeness of the application. In contrast, a conditional use permit is a public hearing process. The application fee is about $7,700. Uh, it does require notification to all property owners and residents within 500 feet of the subject location. It takes about 90 days for the application to go through the process and does require approval from the Planning Commission. So it's a much lengthier process uh, and much more uh, in terms of the application fees. Thank you. And so since the state is already doing what you stated, the planning staff would typically evaluate already, you know, inspection by a fire department, physical inspections of the facilities. Why do we still need a land use permit process? The only reason that we might need a land use permit process is for larger facilities in residential neighborhoods. Really what we want to look at there is, are there going to be impacts to adjacent single family homes or residential homes? That's really the primary thing that we're looking at. Do we do that with other in-home businesses? We don't. However, our home occupation code does not allow um, the amount of traffic, if you will, uh, that a child care facility potentially could generate. And so for the most part, we don't look at that uh, for home occupations. But again, they're restricted in terms of how many uh, customers or, or staff members they can employ in a home-based business. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to the business owner who flagged this for us, because I do think this shows some of the invisible barriers to um, developing child care facilities in the city and, you know, wherever else um, that we might have not known had they not come forward. Thank you so much for your work on this, Flynn. Are there other comments or from council? Is there a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve staff recommendation. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion and second. Roll call, please. Before we do that, if I can, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just further discussion, um, because I'm still remembering that the business we worked with said that the $1,600 land use permit cost was still too much. Um, what we know about child care providers if, is they're often minimum wage workers, um, and they're often not turning a huge profit through their businesses or their um, child care. So uh, through that work. So could you sort of detail, is there, you know, what is the process? Do you think that will be a barrier? Is there a process where council can consider exceptions? Is there a policy that we can have for contingency fund to waive those sometimes at council requests? You would need to adopt a separate policy to waive those application fees. Uh, generally, I would suggest that it shouldn't be a barrier because this only applies in residential zone districts. Most often what we have seen with child care businesses is that you'll have the either daycare small or daycare large in residential districts. Uh, and so that does not require a land use permit, is permitted by right. Uh, it's uh, the, the larger businesses, typically you'll see those in commercial areas because they are a larger facility. They do require additional outdoor space for recreation for children, et cetera. Um, and so, again, I think the majority of businesses that we have in residential neighborhoods will probably be the uh, small homes or the large homes. Thank you. Just for counsel of how this plays out, we're working with a business who needed a land use permit in one location in the city, but also needed fire marshal inspection. It was just very complicated to find a space that worked with a land use permit and also to pay the fee. So I don't know how we deal with that as a policy matter. And, you know, please, this for the public, when you contact us and say, I have a problem with this for as my residence or my business, we really pay attention to that and look for policy solutions. So I think this is a good one and we can track it and see if we have any other issues and people can come to us if they do. Thank you so much for your work. Roll call, please. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Five ayes, zero noes. Motion passes. 
Next item on the agenda is item 3A, second reading adoption of an ordinance amending and restating chapter 5.25 regarding vacation rentals and potential action regarding the existing moratorium on the processing and issuing of vacation rental certificates. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, the item before you is a second reading, which is... And please note heard. that Council Member Holstage uh, is rec recusing herself from this discussion. Thank you. Um, this is a um, second reading of this ordinance that was uh, introduced at the November 10th meeting. Uh, normally, the second reading is a fairly routine process. However, we also wanted to make staff available to answer any questions that the, the council may have, as well as possibly give an update in terms of some of the kind of administrative uh, actions that staff has been taking in order to implement what we anticipate to be the second reading. In it, uh, and so Mr. Clifford is available uh, to provide that after this brief report. Uh, in addition, I'd like to point out a few uh, typographical uh, or clerical errors that were made in the staff report and the ordinance that's included before you. Um, specifically, uh, at the November 10th meeting, there was some discussion about um, the number of uh, permits, or I'm sorry, number of contracts that would be allowed um, for either new permittees uh, or for existing permittees after January 1st, 2026. The staff report uh, uh, and agenda item references that as 24 when it was in fact decided by the city council on November 10th to be 26. Um, so assuming the council moves forward with the second reading, we would uh, correct that uh, typographical error uh, and make it 26 and not 24. In addition, uh, that date uh, for the grandfathering or grandparenting uh, of existing uh, permit holders should be January 1st, 2026, not 2025, as referenced in the staff material. In addition, there were two um, paragraphs in section 5.25.070 uh, that are really um, vestigial from the uh, previous ordinance when this was originally adopted in 2017. Uh, I think it was the intent of the council to have those removed, and so we would do that as well. Uh, and then uh, there was um, reference in the agenda material to a cap of 36 when uh, I believe the discussion at the uh, November 10th meeting uh, really referenced that should be the existing 32 uh, base contracts plus four contracts in the third quarter. That was the language that was uh, presented to the city council at the November 10th meeting. Uh, and uh, our review of the, the uh, video uh, indicates that that was not changed by consensus of the council. So uh, we would be correcting that reference as well. And then I think there was a, a question by at least one member of the public, maybe two, uh, regarding uh, grandparenting of existing uh, permits. Um, I believe it's the city's position that um, at the annual renewal uh, period uh, for any existing permit holders, they would have to be in compliance with this ordinance uh, as it's being adopted, um, irrespective of whether they uh, may have been in compliance with the ordinance uh, prior. So um, just to kind of clarify the record uh, on that issue. Um, that concludes my staff uh, presentation. Again, I believe Mr. Clifford is available to uh, give an update on the uh, staff changes and issues that have been going on. Are there questions for staff? Uh, I do have one question. Uh, if I understood the public comment uh, that we received this evening correctly, uh, we have a case where two individuals each took out permits while they were single, uh, have now uh, been married, and therefore, if they were applying today as a married couple would only be eligible for one permit uh, in a situation like that where they legally obtained permits separately, what has been our practice? What is our policy? Yes, currently, um, you know, with that situation, uh, since they have obtained permits separately before marriage, we have had, allowed to continue to have the two separate vacation rental properties under um, the ownership of um, the married couple going forward. 
And what we would be doing is determining that, in fact, they did uh, legally obtain the permits uh, while they were both single and now continue on. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Can we get a city attorney back? Because I think what we did was say that wouldn't happen moving forward, given they couldn't, if they're married and living together, they couldn't really be using um, them as a, in their use, but so is that a change yeah. to this if we did that, which we can't it, do? It, and maybe the mayor is thinking of a different situation, but the situation that arose this last year, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they were married when they bought the second property, and um, staff and, and our office believe uh, that that is inconsistent with the ordinance's general theme, which is that uh, these are really ancillary uses and should not be uh, um, uh, the primary use. And so therefore, um, having uh, a couple, whether married or uh, under a domestic partnership, um, having two properties, um, again, that just seemed inconsistent with uh, the concept of ancillary use. Um, and so, um, as I just mentioned, I think staff's position would be that um, if those two individuals uh, bought the property as, um, as single uh, people and then got married, uh, they would have to come into compliance with this ordinance um, at the next annual registration, okay. at least under the language as, as drafted. Okay. Well, I, I think we need to be clear as to what it is. Uh, I agree completely uh, if uh, one individual owns a vacation rental permit, they get, they get married and then attempt to take a second permit, that should not be uh, allowed. That's inconsistent with uh, what our uh, rules are. The situation where two individuals living apart, not married, uh, each owning a vacation rental, they then meet, come together, and uh, ultimately marry, I think creates a very different fact scenario as to whether or not they should, uh, at that point, be required uh, to get uh, to sell one of the properties. And, and I'm, uh, I'm open to any argument on this. Uh, I'm simply trying to be fair to yeah. to all sides and clearly when if it's two individuals that were not together when they uh, bought the properties that uh, that's a very different fact scenario and the scenario where they haven't met nor aren't living together is one that would take a lot of inquiry so in this case Certainly we would. have testimony today that they would get divorced so they could do this and then so you're almost like do that get divorced then you can get remarried and you're you're allowed to continue doing it. And that's sort of, that's what that would do. And that's problematic, right? So I don't know how we get into the, really trying to, you know, figure that out, but given it's pretty easy, you know, it's somewhat ridiculous that someone might do that, but they might. Um, but, you know, we're, you do it right before you get married and then you have two vacation rentals and your, your main residence is in, in Palm Springs. So you now have two houses that are being used almost exclusively for vacation rentals and not by someone who's here. That, that's what I think we're trying to avoid, right, when that got drafted into this. Okay. I appreciate your point, but I think it's, com it's, more, it's complicated, right? It is complicated. That's all. And Maybe the city so attorney has some We're advice. certainly trying to be fair. Uh, Mr. Ballinger or anyone on else on council want to, to weigh in? Um, I guess I would just point out, uh, you know, that uh, two individuals who may have purchased their two properties while uh, single individuals and, and become married or uh, registered domestic partners, um, I can I can see some unfairness in having uh, this rule applied to them. It should be pointed out, though, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to sell one or both of the houses. It simply means that they can only hold a vacation rental permit for one of the two houses. They can continue to own both properties. They can continue to uh, reside in both properties uh, and they can do longer term rentals of one or both of the properties. It's just they, they wouldn't be allowed to have 
uh, vacation rental permits for both of them. And again, the, the, the rationale for that is that uh, it seems inconsistent with the concept that um, both of those properties would be uh, ancillary uses or, or the primary use of, of both of the individuals. Understood. Uh, Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wonder about staff's um, bandwidth to um, check marriage licenses, if they're separated, if they're legally separated, if they're just not living together. I mean, do we even have the capacity as a city to look at all of that? Well, with respect to pulling um, you know, marriage licenses and stuff, I don't know the, if there's a path to do that other than going through the county. But what staff does currently when an application comes in, they do check title um, and everything associated with uh, the documents purchasing the house and usually catch um, uh, you know, terminology in there, whether it's purchased as a, a single person or as a married um, couple. And they also um, you know, check those names across the our, uh, vacation rental property list to make sure that um, there's, if there is two names on the title that they don't already have a vacation rental owned um, previously using the same concepts where they looked at title and all the information when they purchased the house. So um, staff does go through a detail of accessing those documents through um, um, title search and, and stuff like that with the county just to make sure that um, ownership is um, not in violation of our ordinance. So if somebody is just in this case uh, that was brought up, if um you know, the title, if they, if they bought them separately before they came together, the title would be each individual person's name, right? And the only way I think the staff would understand that they were married is if they self-disclosed, right? Correct. Um, we do ask for um, every year when properties renew, um, property ownership change. And a lot of times when they complete the paperwork, they'll state um, the new ownerships of the, of the property and then staff can find, say, well, hey, the, the two um, persons listed on the property ownership form I'm now under um, two different certificates, and then they and they do inquire as far as just simply asking questions, um, and then um, looking at um, transaction history through title search, as far as what may have happened, um, and then um, you know this, it's just a handful, maybe one or two cases where we've came across maybe um, um, two persons that are single own vacation rentals prior and then um, entered into a marriage. And if somebody is legally separated, um, how do we want to handle that? That's a good question. Um, you know, if they're legally separated, and um, really our ordinance, when it says the financial and beneficial interest in more than one vacation rental, um, if that person, even though they're still separated, if they're still both on title owning the property, we would still look at it as a financial and beneficial interest in, in one vacation rental. Thank you. Are there other comments from council? So if I'm understanding what I'm hearing, the scenario that uh, I described is not of uh, two people who clearly uh, purchased the properties prior to forming a relationship is not what we're presented with this evening. Uh, and uh, so I'm comfortable with moving forward. Can we just I'd check that that's the case? Because I'm not sure that is what the ordinance but I, now I, says. I would ask staff to to uh, investigate further and to come back. Uh, my last comment on this is I would look uh, with great disfavor anyone coming forward and trying to evade uh, our rules by uh, uh, legally separating or doing something else uh, with marital status that was solely directed uh, towards uh, obtaining a second permit. Um, yeah. If you'd like, I can give a clarification on maybe what that um, other scenario might have been, or I can follow up. Um, and, and for clarification, my understanding is the way the ordinance is drafted, if two people each independently own a, uh, have a vacation rental permit, once they are married, they will have to relinquish one permit. Thank you. If there is no further discussion, do we have a motion to approve? Uh, I'll move the item. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. <clears throat> Councilmember Coors. Yes. 
Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. I have four ayes, zero noes, and one recusal. Motion passes. All right, thank you. Uh, we can now invite uh, uh, Council Member Holstage to rejoin us for item 3B. Well, Council Member Holstage, welcome back. But I just wanted to let people know in this interim that our one of our Palm Springs residents and District 1 resident, Charlie Irvin, will be sworn in as our new um, school board member on December 13th at 6 p.m. So anybody who wants to see that happen, just to let you know. Congratulations, Mr. Irvin. Next item is 3B, a proposed update of the Palm Springs Municipal Code 5.77 pertaining to adult-oriented businesses and repeal of Chapter 11.10 pertaining to public nudity. May we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor and members of council, as a preface to this discussion this evening, I just want to point out that uh, this is one of those topics they don't prepare you for in urban planning school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> However, I will say I have been responsible for regulating adult businesses in four different communities across three different states. And I can tell you that the ordinances are amazingly similar. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and get into our presentation this evening. The ordinance that we currently have on uh, the books in our municipal code was last amended in 1995. And so one of the things that we try to do on a regular basis is to update our ordinances. I think you've seen this with our annual update to the zoning code. There are other ordinances in the municipal code that we would like to update on a regular basis as conditions change. And so this is one of the main reasons why we're bringing this forward to you. And that is that things have significantly changed in the industry since we last addressed this topic. And so with that, there are a number of changes that staff would recommend to you. Let me give you some background in terms of uh, what adult businesses uh, require in terms of permitting and also in terms of location and then also define what aren't adult businesses because many times that is also confused. First of all, adult uses are permitted by right. They do not require land use permits. They do not require conditional use permits. And this, again, is something that we see as a standard practice, uh, as I had mentioned in the various jurisdictions in which I've worked. Uh, secondly, in our uh, community, adult businesses are allowed only in industrial zones. Uh, and so I have listed there the industrial zones are uh, commercial manufacturing zone, our M1 manufacturing zone, uh, M1P uh, manufacturing professional zone, and our M2 manufacturing zone. Uh, and so they are currently only allowed in industrial zones. What people often think are adult businesses are not. For example, here in Palm Springs, we have many clothing optional hotels. Those are not defined as an adult business in our code, and so they are not subject to an adult business permit. Live art classes, I think that goes without saying that uh, figure drawing classes offered by a college or a community art facility uh, are not an adult business. And then the third category that aren't considered to be adult businesses are stores that may have uh, adult products but only a small percentage of their inventory or floor space is adult products. And so we have a number of retail businesses in the Sunny Dunes area on Arenas. Uh, you have a business owner this evening on North Palm Canyon. Uh, 
uh, whose businesses sell adult products, but again, it's not the largest part of their inventory. Much of their inventory is clothing, which is not considered to be an adult product. And so they are exempt from uh, being required to obtain an adult business permit, and they may locate in standard uh, commercial zones. And so those are not adult businesses. What are adult businesses is the list that you see here on the right in the table. What I would propose is, again, because there have been significant changes in the industry over the last approximately 30 years, is that we uh, cull that list down into four more generalized categories. Uh, the first would be an adult entertainment establishment. Uh, the current uses that we have, that would include an adult cabaret or a strip club, adult model studio. I don't know that I've ever seen those anywhere, <laughs> but we have that listed in our code. And then finally, an adult theater, which I believe goes beyond a strip club or a bar uh, that, offers, uh, this, uh, that offers that type of entertainment. Uh, the next category is an adult hotel or motel. Uh, we don't have any of those in our city currently. I don't know that we've had any permits for those in the past, in the recent, in the recent past. We're not proposing any changes there other than uh, a change to its uh, definition. One of the things that identifies an adult hotel or motel is that the uh, rooms are rented for less than a 24-hour period. In our current definition, it also states that they essentially play adult movies or DVDs. Um, sadly, that would and encompass uh, the Hilton chain, the Marriott chain. Most hotel chains do offer adult movies. Uh, and so we've taken that language out of the definition of an adult hotel or motel because then pretty much any hotel would be an adult hotel or motel. The third category is an adult retail establishment, and so that would have been historically an adult bookstore or a motion picture arcade, two uses that we're seeing much less of uh, across the country, uh, just again because of changes in the industry. Finally, uh, changing the name of this one, we define a sex club in our zoning code. We're changing the name of that to an adult sex venue, uh, which is more in line with industry standards uh, today. Um, currently, sex clubs are prohibited in the city of Palm Springs, and so this is one of the changes that we're proposing to you this evening, uh, is to allow that as a permitted use. In terms of changes to uses, as I had mentioned, we're only currently allowing those in industrial districts. There's an additional caveat in our code which says they're also prohibited on major or secondary thoroughfares. And so that essentially is any four-lane or six-lane roadway. So for example, Palm Canyon. They would be prohibited on Palm Canyon. They would be prohibited on Ramon. They would be prohibited on Tokwitz, Vista Chino, et cetera. Um, there are industrial pockets in the Sunny Dunes area on the north end of town off of Farrell Drive uh, that aren't on uh, major or secondary thoroughfares. So there are still parcels that are available for that. If you want to consider additional zones where these uses may be permissible, one of the things I've suggested is in our C2, a general commercial zone, or HC, highway commercial zone. Um, another thing to consider possibly is the C1 zone, but I wouldn't recommend that unless you require a conditional use permit to examine adjacencies and impacts to adjacent businesses. As we look at potentially discussing, discussing whether we should allow this in the C2 and HC zone, um, C2 zone district properties, primarily in the area of Sunny Dunes and South Palm Canyon, again, keeping in mind that they would not be permitted on Palm Canyon as one of our major thoroughfares. The highway commercial zone is primarily at the intersection of I-10 and Indian Canyon. Again, Indian Canyon is a major thoroughfare. So we could allow them in the HC zone, but they wouldn't be permitted to front on Indian Canyon. So those are two possibility to consider. However, you may just want to keep it where it is currently and only allow adult businesses in industrial zone districts. 
Another uh, series of changes that we might recommend to you is relative to separation distance. In terms of protected uses, such as parks, schools, playgrounds, et cetera, what we might offer to you is consider increasing that separation distance from 500 feet to 600 feet. The reason that we're recommending that is so that there is a similar standard that we have already in place for cannabis uses. What that does is it helps to simplify uh, the separation distance from protected uses by having uh, a single standard that we apply there. One of the issues that we've heard in public testimony is separation from residential areas. As I had mentioned, one of the areas where adult uses are permitted is in the Sunny Dunes vicinity. However, we do have residential areas immediately to the east and then also to the south on the other side of Tokwitz. Current, uh, Tokwitz Creek, excuse me. Uh, currently, we require a 650 foot separation distance from residential areas. And so, what that does is it leaves a very limited area where those businesses can locate. Uh, we used to have a strip club in the Sunny Dunes area that was closer to Palm Canyon, while obviously not directly on Palm Canyon. Uh, so there's a small handful of parcels where adult businesses could locate in the Sunny Dunes area because of this residential separation requirement. What we might consider is modifying that. What I've proposed in the ordinance is that adult businesses could not be adjacent to residential areas. And by adjacent, that means that they could not be next to a residential property, nor could they be across a street from a residential property. So that would offer some protection from residential areas. In discussing this, one of the other things we might consider is rather than decreasing the residential separation distance is to perhaps institute a waiver process whereby much like with cannabis uses for dispensaries or lounges, we allow city council to waive that distance separation requirement based upon criteria where we can still offer protection to residential properties. And so that might be an alternative uh, if you are interested in modifying the residential separation distance. In terms of separation from other adult businesses, currently our code says that they can't be adjacent. So similar to uh, what I was proposing for residential, cannot be next to or across a right of way from. I'm not proposing to make any changes to that. However, should city council want to investigate doing that, what we could look at is a similar standard that we apply to cannabis businesses where we apply a 500 foot separation distance between adult businesses. And so that might be an acceptable remedy if that's one direction that you would like to go. Looking at some of the general changes we're proposing to update the ordinance, one of the things I'm proposing is to expand the retail threshold. Um, currently, as I had mentioned, uh, businesses where 10% or less of their inventory as adult products are not considered to be an adult-oriented businesses. I'm proposing to up that to 20%. The reason that I'm doing that is, uh, again, familiarizing myself with local businesses. Uh, I'm seeing that some are borderline on the 10% requirement. Rather than having to go through the process of having those businesses relocate to industrial areas, what I think might be more acceptable is to bump that threshold up to 20%. It's a modest change. I don't think it will have an impact in terms of uh, adjacencies with other businesses. Uh, and so that's one of the recommendations I would make for the retail uh, exemption. Secondly, one of the things I would propose is we have language now about the physical layout of adult-oriented businesses which is a bit out of date and could vary significantly based on the type of business and their physical uh, uh, um, uh, interior environment. What I'm recommending is for adult sex venues and adult entertainment establishments or strip clubs is that each require a security plan that's reviewed and approved by our police department. 
the reason I'm suggesting that is we have a similar standard in place for nightclubs. I think it would be appropriate to have this apply to those two types of adult businesses uh, in looking at protection for patrons of those businesses. Another thing that we might look at is modifying the operating hour limitations for adult businesses. Uh, much like we have for alcohol uses, we could change that to 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. They have to be closed between those hours. Uh, there is an exception for adult hotels and motels, obviously. Uh, another thing I've talked about, eliminating interior configuration requirements and evaluating that on a case-by-case -case basis as we look at their security plans. And then there are other requirements that are currently in our adult business ordinance, such as outdoor lighting, um, bathroom configurations, which are addressed by our zoning code and our building code respectively. They don't need to be here. We just refer to them as we review these types of businesses. And so I propose that we eliminate some language there that is already addressed in other locations in our municipal code. One of the things that we don't address here that has proven to be uh, an issue is that some hotels are offering day passes, um, some are holding events. As I've mentioned, our clothing optional hotels are not adult businesses. Um, however, this continues to be uh, uh, an area of interest that I think we need to look at further. What I'd propose is rather than going into that this evening, staff would like to come back with a proposal to look at a permitting process for events and day passes at our hotels. That's something that we would want to review with our hotel organizations that we have here in town uh, to come up with an acceptable solution to address that. Next, we're also proposing changes to the public nudity ordinance. Um, perhaps we've been a little aggressive in suggesting that we eliminate it entirely. Um, the reason that we had proposed that is there's already language in state law which addresses public nudity. We're not suggesting that we need to be more permissive uh, as some uh, public comment letters had suggested or that we'd be opening ourselves up to issues where uh, public sex occurs. That's not what we're looking to do. Um, what we're looking to do is we're looking to hold a similar standard as would be found in state law. However, I think there's another way that we can do that uh, with a couple of minor tweaks to our existing public nudity ordinance. Um, first of all, we can look at our definition of public nudity and make some minor corrections and changes to that. Secondly, I think we can add language from Section 314 of the State Code, uh, which addresses intent that um, public nudity absent prurient intent or willful lewdness, things like that, help to address the question of intent relative to public nudity. And so I think that there's a couple of minor modifications that we can make to our existing ordinance to address public concern. Uh, some of those concerns were uh, brought up in public comment at our last city council meeting. Uh, and then finally, again, there is no need to modify this if you don't feel the changes are necessary. So those are options that you have before you relative to the public nudity ordinance. So I've given you a lot of information to consider this evening. Um, what I might suggest as discussion points for you is covering the following areas. Um, in terms of adult business uses, looking at the proposed modifications to the uses themselves, including allowing adult sex venues um, as a permitted use in industrial districts. Secondly, looking at keeping the adult businesses in industrial districts or whether you want to look at expanding that to other commercial zones. Third, looking at separation distances if you want to modify those. Uh, fourth, looking at any general changes, security plans, things like that. And then finally, number five, looking at the public nudity ordinance. So those are essentially five areas where staff would look to direction from city council in terms of changes that you might want to make to our existing ordinances. That concludes my presentation to you and I'm happy to answer questions. And I'll ask that Mr. Ballinger also be on hand to answer any questions of law. So with that, uh, mayor, council members, happy to take your questions. 
Uh, Flynn, outstanding. Uh, questions for staff, Council Member Coors. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a bunch of questions. Um, most of them I think I've already run by um, our Deputy City Manager and the City Attorney uh, for a heads up, although a couple more came out during the presentation. So, um, so can, I don't know if you have diagrams or can you just give very specifics on what the new potential areas would be? Yes, absolutely. I think if you've I could... answered that Sunny Dunes already is allowed. Yes. Because a lot of public comment I got was that we were adding that. Um, yeah. So, oh, you do have the pictures. Of course you do. <laughs> so in terms of the two zone districts, if you were to expand, these are the two that I'd recommend to you outside of the industrial zone districts where it's currently permitted. Uh, I had recommended the C2 zone. The map that you see there on the left is showing the intersection of South Palm Canyon and Sunny Dunes Road. The parcels in purple are the C2 uh, zoned parcels. There are a number of those that are directly on South Palm Canyon, so adult businesses could not be located on those parcels directly facing South Palm Canyon. There's a couple of parcels to the west that are zoned C2 that are not on a major or secondary thoroughfare. So it does open up a couple of additional parcels, um, but it's a very <laughs> limited area where those would be permitted. The second area that I'm suggesting is the highway commercial zone, which is up on the, uh, near the intersection of I-10 and North Indian Canyon. And those are the parcels that are identified in turquoise in the map on the right. And so parcels directly fronting on Indian Canyon would not allow an adult business, but there are some on Garnett uh, where adult businesses could locate. So it does open up a couple of additional parcels. Overall, by making this changes to allowing in C2 and the highway commercial zone, with the restriction that they can't locate on a primary or secondary thoroughfare, it opens up a limited number of parcels. And so I just want to be quite clear that it's not going to probably expand to the degree that some business owners might hope, but also to the community concerns, it won't allow the expansion of adult businesses to the degree that they fear. Um, and so that's what I would recommend. I had suggested in the staff report that we could look at C1, but I'll be perfectly honest because most of our C1 parcels are on South Palm Canyon and North Palm Canyon, both north and south of downtown. They're on a major thoroughfare. And so allowing it in C1, even by a conditional use permit, would not expand the number of parcels that would be eligible for adult businesses. And so I really wouldn't look at expanding to C1 at this point based on the restrictions that we have. Uh, thank you. And just one thing, and thank you for explaining why um, closing option, optional hotels are not part of this ordinance. Um, so is there any regulation? I know we're gonna look at this later, but just uh, given this came up and just to get it answered publicly. So for a hotel that sells day or night passes, clothing optional to, the, to their hotel, for someone who's not staying in a room that allows uh, sexual activity in public areas of the private hotel. Um, so people are paying to go to those. That's not considered a sex venue under our ordinance. That's allowed currently? Two separate questions, sorry. <laughs> yes, it is two separate questions. Yes. Um, in terms of clothing optional hotels and sex on the grounds of clothing optional hotels, um, we don't consider those to be adult businesses. We don't regulate what activities take place on the grounds of a hotel for the most part. Um, what complicates the issue is when they are inviting outside guests to the property, selling day passes or in other instances, we've seen them have events at the hotel that are held out to the general public. That becomes more problematic, and that's one of the reasons why I want to propose a separate ordinance to come forward to address those issues. Uh, I think one of the concerns that we have from those types of events is 
very simple in that it creates a parking issue in neighborhoods, especially at the smaller hotels where they don't have additional parking spaces to accommodate uh, over and above the guests that are registered at the hotel. And then secondly, to avoid conflicts with our adult business ordinance, we don't want to have adult businesses in zones where they're not permitted. So outside of industrial areas. So two separate issues, correct. Um, I think that we can address it through looking at events and day passes at hotels. Oh, great, um, thank you. Then I have some specific um, questions and I realize this ordinance is I'm doing math in my head, but almost 30 years old. And so knowing why things were put in maybe uh, beyond anyone's knowledge here, but since you've worked on them in other cities, um, you might know. Um, so going to page 14, we'll start there just so, so it's 14 of the staff report, not 14 of the ordinance. Okay, so I'll be using staff pages. Um, so in specified anatomical parts, um, so one, um, is pubic region defined? It seems that could it not be clear to someone. And yeah, so it's, it's a not for defined it? other than being included in the definition of an adult business. Um, so there's not a separate definition for that in our municipal code. Um, so that's something we could take out, potentially. Yes, that's something that we can look at and use more general terms. Okay, um, I see you took out buttocks here, although I have it in some other places. So when we, we do this, make sure it's consistent maybe consistent. Um, I do think whatever the appropriate terms are, but you know, we might want to then, if we're focused on genitals, add um, anus or, or whatever the appropriate words and other codes are. Um, for that purpose, since we're taking out buttocks okay. and really just focusing page? more narrowly, so to speak. Um, page 14. Um, so, so the bottom part of a female breast is considered sexual, but the top part isn't. Any idea on that? Uh, that goes back a long ways, and it's something we see not only in adult business ordinances, um, but you also see that in FCC practices in terms of uh, television programming and broadcast television in particular. Um, I, I don't know why that exists. It's something that's been done historically, however. Okay, and I know some of these will also relate to the nudity ordinance because, um, but it's always struck me that we're some discriminatory um, differences between men and women here. Um, that we might want to discuss. So I wanted to raise that because I, I, I'm concerned about it. So the second part, um, number two on this, um, I guess one is purpose, right? Even if completely and opaquely covered, and this is for human male genitals in a discernibly turgid state. I would also suggest we use plain English um, if we're gonna keep it like a rec penis so people understand what we're talking about. Uh, but what is the purpose of that, given we have genitals covered above in number one? And I realize this is even if completely opaquely covered, that's the slight difference here. Um, I would suggest when we go through this, taking number two out, I think one, it's not always obvious, um, and two, it can change um, without consent of the human. So. I would suggest we, we take that one out. Um, when we go to specified sexual activities, um, so just so it's clear, that would include simulated activities, right? Even if someone is dressed, and what is the purpose of that? We can remove that term. Okay. Um, again, this is something that okay. 
No, I mean, I'm just, if, the, if you know of a purpose based on other cities, I, I would be. I don't. Okay. I don't. Um, You know, I think the same applies, you know, to flagellation. If people are dressed and it's consensual, I'm just trying to understand some of these that are, right, just, I appreciate this is old, but, you know, so I have concerns on a bunch of those. Um, you know, I, can, I mean, all of these, right? So, you know, number two, you know, clear, clearly depicted genitals in a state of arousal, um, Three, again, four, depending on what we do with the language of buttocks and female breast, would apply here, and um, pubic region. Um, and then for number seven, where we're talking about, um, you know, menstruation, vaginal or anal irrigation, I mean, unless for medical purposes, um, right, I mean, you don't want them brought, you know, medical places brought into this. And I know that's not the goal. Um, I mean, the way this, this reads, breastfeeding wouldn't um, even be allowed. So, you know, I do think, obviously, we want to talk about all these as a council. I just wanted to flag a few of, few of them. There's not a lot more. Um, in 15... On page 15. Yeah, please. Yeah, no. Yep, I'm fine. Mayor, can I ask about that section so we don't have to go back to that? I mean, this whole, this whole def defining portion is very outdated. The language that it uses, it uses sodomy, which I think is sort of a um, word that has judgment in it, obviously is related to um, some of the public comment we heard, um, and you think you would um, have anal sex or other more medical terms that um, doctors use. I'm on the board of Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. We talk about these terms, um, you know, and these aren't the terms that we use that are in here. So um, I think my question to the city attorney is, does this, and then I just had to Google what tumescence meant. Um, and I've never heard that term. So um, I think the regular public is not going to know what that means either. So to the city attorney, can we use some normal terms here? I mean, does the, do we need to really specify out all of these sexual acts in this code? I mean, there's also some, um, you know, there's, there's a lot in there that, um, yeah. So can you just um, tell us, do we need to define every single sexual act? Is there a broader way that we could define this? Can we at least update? It sounds like staff will update to more medically accurate terms. But city attorney, what do you think? We, we can. In fact, that's, that's really the point to bring this ordinance forward is to, to bring it up to date with currently uh, used terminology. Uh, it doesn't need to be um, legalese. It does need to be specific because we're dealing with um, some uh, businesses that have First Amendment protection. And so because of that First Amendment protection, uh, the language can't be vague to an ordinary reader. Um, but as you pointed out, there are quite a few terms in here that require a dictionary to, to figure out what they are. And so um, if the council gives us that direction, we can go back and um, modify this language so that it is specific, but also readable and not non legalese. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with all of your points uh, that you made and thank you for doing that. And there, there are more. Um, and, uh, the last one I want to touch on is actually page 18. It used to be 24 in the old ordinance. It's now 20 in the new ordinance. So this is saying when there's live entertainment, patrons shall be physically separated from performers by a buffer zone of at least six feet. Um, and you know, some of our definitions would apply to bars and clubs that have go-go dancers, right, on boxes. And people are not only not six feet, they're putting bills um, in their underwear, right? Um, so we don't even do this now. Um, so I don't know why we would still have this, unless our goal is to Change, change what is actually happening. So in 
reviewing this with the city attorney, we don't believe there's a need to keep that buffer zone. Okay. I, I do want to point out, however, that some of our bars that currently operate on arenas or on sunny dunes uh, are not adult businesses, and so this would not necessarily apply to their operations. Um, their dancers are generally closed, as far as I know, uh, and so it doesn't constitute an adult business per se. So, and that was going to be um, a question, right? So, right, I, the goal is not to have those be adult businesses, but the way we have a strip club defined, right, where you have to be covered, there's no difference in what the coverings are. So, they. It seems totally inconsistent that we're allow one has to be defined one way and the other is defined differently. So if we are going to incorporate strip clubs, then we they shouldn't really have any different rules than bars where people are wearing actually the same amount of clothes, mm -hmm. right? If you if someone's wearing a jockstrap in one or another, it's not really different. Yep. Understood. Right. So I think that's just something we need to fix. The other question I had is timing, right? I understand. The 2 to 6 a.m. for bars goes with when you're allowed to serve alcohol. Um, you know, sometimes a venue like a, what we're now calling a sex venue, um, becomes a safe place for people to go after bars closed versus the wash or a park, for example. And I think our residents, um, we sometimes get complaints about people in parks um, and the wash. So I'm not sure that may be a prime time and Given it's all indoors, I'm not sure what the impact is to other businesses when they're closed, mm -hmm. right? So I might get rid of that or change those or have flexibility when someone applies. Because okay. there is no alcohol allowed in those hours, so, right? Okay, those, that was in my, my questions. Thank you. Are there other questions? If not, I have a few questions. And again... Flynn, I want to commend you and staff for bringing forward uh, what's uh, a difficult subject in, in a very professional fashion. Uh, going back to page 14, um, I see that uh, in section one, uh, you have eliminated a number of things and included in that is pederasty and pedophilia. Uh, so could you explain why that's being removed? I will apologize, and uh, perhaps those two should remain in the list. I, I think as we go through and change the language here to more medically accurate terms, as has been recommended, uh, we can also make sure that we are uh, protecting things that need to be protected, and those two that you've pointed out are ones that should probably remain in there. I, I can only speak for myself, but absolutely they uh, must be protected. Uh, in if, if, if I might, on those issues, we might actually want to add some language that those are prohibited because they are prohibited under uh, both Thanks. state and federal law, and so we don't want to put them back in and suggest that a business, which is now going to be allowed, can include that type of material. Thank you, Mr. Ballinger. I think it, we need to be abundantly clear uh, that uh, these are prohibited activities at all times. Uh, further up in that section, you've uh, eliminated buttocks. Is there, and it does, is the intent to uh, well, tell me what your intent is. Uh, trying to distinguish our uh, bars and the events that they offer, um, as we had in public testimony at the last city council meeting, there were a number of patrons who expressed concern that perhaps they could be arrested uh, wearing a jock strap from their car to the bar facility itself where they may have an underwear night. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I was proposing to take buttocks out is exactly for that reason. Um, it's just to uh, make it clear that we're not going after people who are attending an event in a bar, um, but rather that that activity is permissible within the confines of the bar itself. 
If I could ask uh, the police chief, uh, have we ever made such an arrest? And is that, would that be the policy of the police department when someone is moving from their car to a event uh, taking place inside a bar? Uh, to my knowledge, Madam Mayor, we have not made any arrests uh, for exposed buttocks um, recently. I'm so my concern is I appreciate uh, someone uh, going from their car directly to uh, a bar. Uh, but uh, in eliminating this, we open it up uh, to confusion uh, on a very broad basis. And I don't know how many emails I've gotten in the last uh, 24 hours uh, saying that we're planning to, uh, to make it uh, possible for individuals to walk down Palm Canyon. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm concerned about this language. Okay, and that was not the intent. Yeah. Mayor, can I ask a follow-up yeah. um, for, for the chief or deputy city manager? So someone wearing a thong bikini, which would expose the same amount, is that allowed, not allowed? Well, okay. I believe in the current ordinance, it is not allowed. So, I mean, that would, I think it's sort of going for, for that, right? Um, versus the sexual parts that are potentially sexual, which is what I suggested adding in. But that was, that was the reasoning, right? Because a lot of cities don't have that outdated rule. Yeah, if I can, just cut to the chase of what we're dealing with here. Um, I think a lot of our rules on the books are absurd in context of what actually happens at any given show in Palm Springs on any given night. And so if you've attended Splash House, which I have, I've seen many a thong um, on all different genders. Um, and that's just happening. And, and that's, you know, um, society has sort of updated where we were in the 90s. And remember back in Palm Springs, the anti-thong ordinance and some of these anti um, others, um, anti-nudity was really in a reaction to shut down spring break. Um, and you'll see, I think, some of that in the, if, if that's correct. Um, that's my understanding of the history. And so um, it really is not in line with what we're seeing happening. People already are, if you go, um, you know, to a, a club, nightclub here like Hunter's, you are seeing people um, in thong underwear or jock straps. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, we can talk about it in circles, but really it's important to say a lot of this is happening. So we want to make sure that it's modernized in a way that is consistent, in my opinion, with what's happening and allowing some of that activity. We know our police um, aren't enforcing a lot of those rules, but I'll say I went to a drag show um, that happened to be at Moxie, so it was visible from the street, um, and then the police came because the noise, I believe there was a noise complaint, and the Please shut down the noise, the, the drag show. And what happens if you're a city council member at a drag show that is shut down, everyone comes to you. Um, and the public was really concerned that uh, the show was shut down because the performer um, was showing um, their top, their breasts, and it was actually a trans performer. So we're just getting into a lot of conversations around equity and equality and gender um, that I want to say, but I think it is important to have these clear definitions so people know what is and what isn't um, allowed, um, both in these sex venues, um, but also, you know, I'm interested in also updating and modernizing our public nudity ordinance to just be consistent with state law because we are seeing a lot of those conversations in other cities um, take those actions to make them less inequitable and discriminatory. Councilmember Woods, and again, we are in, at the point of asking questions. Uh, can I just ask, um, on page uh, 14 of the staff report, items one through eight, those are definitions, right? And are those definitions that are prohibited? I'm, I'm just un unclear about what they mean. So they are uh, definitions of activities that may or may not be permitted at adult businesses. 
So this section pertains specifically to adult businesses. Um, you'll see in other definitions in terms of uh, what an adult-oriented business is or what adult entertainment is that we refer to specified uh, sexual activities or specified anatomical parts. And so what this does, this definition of uh, both of those things on page 14 are used elsewhere in defining specific adult-oriented businesses. So just, I, I want to, I, Flynn, thank you, but I want to be very clear. So um, take this number, um, uh, number four, for example. Where would that be later in the, how would that apply? So in terms of, um, In terms of the definition, if I could go back to page 11, the definition of adult entertainment establishment, uh, it defines that as being a bar, lounge, nightclub, live theater, etc., cetera, um, which is distinguished or characterized by an emphasis on or relating to specified sexual activities or specified anatomical parts. So you'll see those two terms referenced under definitions of specific types of adult businesses. So if, um, so when is a bar an adult business and when is it not? So the difference between the bars that we have currently, we don't have any strip clubs in the city of Palm Springs right now. As I'd mentioned, we had one historically, but don't currently. Um, primarily the difference is, uh, and this is also based on gender, um, is what is permissible as part of the entertainment. So for example, um, and because we have a preponderance of venues that cater to a gay clientele, uh, as has been mentioned, we typically have some type of male dancers at those clubs. Uh, however, they are typically uh, at least partially clothed. Um, if we were to go to the typical strip club that we might see elsewhere, uh, where there are female uh, dancers, that they would be permitted to uh, not have a top, um, and depending on the ordinance, would still have to have a bottom on. So it gets into the difference between um, the bars that may have some type of dancer or entertainment and the degree of nudity that would be associated with that. One of the things to also take into consideration is that bars are also regulated by uh, the State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control, and so they also monitor those activities as well. So my um, concern is, um uh, one, I think the question was earlier, it's really not about what we currently do, it's about having the laws on the book to make sure that we can't arrest somebody for something. Uh, so we, the administration could change, the police chief could change, anything could change on that. And, and, and so the one through eight, I'm, I'm a little, it's a little problematic for me. And I'll give you um, number five. There are many bars that will hold um, BDSM seminars to teach people how to do it safe, what it means. Uh, sexuality can or can't be included as part of that. But just to exclude it um, seems um, very unfair um, when our neighboring cities allow it. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a concern. And, it, and, so, and, and that goes with a lot of them. And I guess uh, uh, many of them are, might be done in a, in, in a back room of a bar and obviously that doesn't apply, but if they do that on a regular basis, a monthly basis, and have a seminar and teach people, you know, how does that apply? Are they then an adult business? You know, and would they have to apply for a special permit? I, I agree with um, both um, Council Member Coors and um, I agree with Council Member um, Holstage that I think it's just, um, it's antiquated and it really, really needs to be updated. To, to modern times and to the freedoms that this community has fought so hard for for decades. So hard for for decades. So.
Are there other questions for, from council, for staff? Council Member Holstage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So sorry, sometimes we do split up legislative items and take questions and discussion, and sometimes we don't. So um, I apologize, you wanted to do it that way. Um, I have a question about the businesses selling sexually oriented merchandise. Um, and so that was something I learned today, that they're limited to 10%, and that is why it makes sense. Um, why their stores are the way they are, the real retail establishments I've seen in the city. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about 20% and how you came to that number? Is that the industry standard? Should it be higher than that? I mean, um, I'm sort of looking at, you know, yeah, what is the consistent rules that other cities are applying? Because it does seem like there's potentially some level of animus um, in the outdated ordinances and the terms that they're using, especially about gay men. Um, and so anyway, I just wanna make sure that we're removing any of the animus or anti-LGBTQ potential there um, in our laws. So yeah, can you just explain um, from 10 to 20% and what the industry standard is that you've seen? And you've worked in Las Vegas too, right? So you're one of the True. best people to advise the city here. <laughs> I, I don't know if I want that to be on my resume per se, but um, in looking at our current standard of 10%, I will say just again, based on professional experience, it seems a little low to me. And in looking at other communities and how they define what an adult business is versus those that aren't. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I had recommend raising it to 20%. That was a standard that we had in Las Vegas. Uh, and believe it or not, we still do have rather stringent standards in Las Vegas relative to adult businesses. Uh, but it was a little bit more generous in terms of the threshold that we use to define an adult business. And again, just kind of doing a visual survey of existing retail stores, uh, I find that 20% would be a more agreeable standard uh, I don't see that there are any major issues with our existing businesses on arenas, for example, or on sunny dunes. I, I don't think that they should become adult businesses. Um, and so allowing them a little bit more uh, flexibility in terms of the percentage of their inventory, I think would be appropriate without doing any impacts to adjacent businesses or the community. I see. So this is the level where a business then would become an adult-oriented business. So if you go to um, a store where it does have a room or a small portion, if it's less than that 20%, then they're not an adult-oriented business. But if it's more than 20%, then they are limited to being in those confined areas. In, in the industrial areas, yes. And could you go back to the map or just explain to me, so if we uh, move staff recommendation and allow um, adult-oriented businesses in C2 zone and HC zone, so are these the only place in the city that it would be it would change? There are no other C2 zones in the city that it would apply to? No. Um, unusually for our zoning code, we do have a number of zone districts where there's limited parcels within that zone district. Uh, this is the case both with the C2 zone and the highway commercial zone. Something that we'll look at as we get to the zoning code update to perhaps streamline our zone districts. Uh, but for the time being, these are the areas where they would be permitted. So this change, if we move staff recommendation, might only apply to 10 or 20 or fewer parcels. It would be 10 at a maximum. Right. It's more like five or so. Yes. Less than 10. And then you said something. So I'm interested in the um, C1 in, with a CUP um, just to treat, you know, like other businesses, but include the impact. So, but you said that that might not apply to very many more parcels. Is that right? Because of where C1 is in the city. Correct. Because the C1 zone district occurs primarily along major thoroughfares, that it really would not have the benefit of um, adding to the number of parcels where adult businesses could be located. Also because there are a number of adjacency issues with C1 districts, um, I, I think we'd have some additional issues with adjacency to residential, uh, where residential areas are immediately behind C1 zone properties. So 
I, I don't really see adding C1 to the pool of available zone districts where adult businesses may be located really gets us anywhere. And so for that reason, I really wouldn't recommend that we pursue it at this point in time. Thanks. And then this map, it actually isn't everywhere, for example, that you see the purple or you see the blue, like you stated, because there you have to exempt the parcels on a major thoroughfare or ones that are along the adjacent to um, residential. So it's even smaller than this map here. And my point is just it's a lot of work for very few parcels that are going to be impacted in this. Yes, you're correct. Thank you. And then can you just talk about, my last question is waiver process. So if staff does recommend a waiver process um, and what that could look like. So if we want to look at rather than modifying the separation distance, uh, in particularly looking at the separation from residential areas, what we might institute is a similar waiver process that we currently use for cannabis dispensaries and lounges whereby if they are within that separation distance, they would file an administrative minor modification application. Uh, there would be notification to properties within 500 feet. Uh, the item would then be considered by the city council. Uh, we would give you criteria with which to consider that application request. And so city council would have the ability to approve or deny based on criteria that looks at impacts to primarily residential areas. So we ha would have to set a waiver process that would go to city council or we could give it to the authority to the city manager, or the planning commission, or you recommend city council? Um, you could do it a number of different ways. My recommendation would be to make it similar to the cannabis waiver process just for the sake of consistency. Got it. And then if I always, five years I haven't learned, I always say my final question and I have one more question. So I see that the permit required on page 14, so it says that the city requires both an adult oriented business permit and a business license from the city of Palm Springs. Is there a reason why we're requiring two licenses or permits? Is that to track which businesses are adult oriented or can you explain the need for both? I don't believe that there would be a need for both. We could actually simplify that uh, and have the business license serve as the adult business permit. As part of the licensing process, we would review compliance with this ordinance anyway. Uh, and so I think what we could do is just standardize it into a, the business license process. Thank you. We're all about admin, relieving administrative burden. Um, oh, and then I have one other question if I can. So other cities, we've, sorry, we've um, talked about Cathedral City and other cities which um, are competing with us for adult-oriented businesses and attracting LGBTQ communities. And by the way, when um, we were working on the MPOX vaccine, we learned a lot about sex tourism in the Coachella Valley and how many events um, and how many people are coming to the Coachella Valley. So we actually, to the public comment, we know that's already an industry that is happening here. We want to make sure it's safe and regulated. Um, so do you know, did you research what Cathedral City and other cities have in terms of a public nudity ordinance and anti, you know, um, banning female breasts, banning thongs, um, and then the adult-oriented businesses? Um, in terms of adult-oriented business ordinances, I primarily looked at larger cities that have recently updated their ordinances. And so for that reason, uh, San Francisco is probably the most current in terms of revisions to their ordinance. Uh, I also looked at Los Angeles and San Diego just as comparables. I'll confess that I didn't look at Cathedral City, and I'll apologize. I don't want to uh, throw shade on Cathedral City, uh, but perhaps we can look at that if we bring this item back to you in terms of how they are regulating public nudity, et cetera. Thank you. I just um, thank you for that. And sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just thinking that this has been um, this has been deemed one way sort of in the newspaper. But I think actually a lot of cities would just be consistent with state law, for example, for public nudity. And it's, in fact, unique that Palm Springs has our own ordinance um, restricting some of these behaviors. Is that your understanding? Yes, it is my understanding that we have adopted our own ordinance and many communities rely on state law. Thank you. Council Member Woods, then I think Council Member Coors and Ann. Uh, Flynn, I'll eventually I'm, get to mine too. Oh, sorry. You want, I can. No, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, 
the, um, the former gas building on Sunrise, um, it, do we know what zone that is in? The former gas building is within the Section 14 specific plan, and it has a commercial designation. Uh, it's not going to be standardized with our C1 or C2 or other zone districts uh, because, again, it's within the Section 14 specific plan. So if somebody want, it seems like a good venue, it, you know, it has great parking, it's secure. If somebody wanted to do something at that location, would they be allowed to? No, they wouldn't because the Section 14 plan does not specifically allow adult-oriented businesses. So we're not only looking at our zoning code, but the Section 14 zoning code, or the, the zoning in the Section 14 as well, because it's its own zoning regulations. Correct. Okay, and we have other specific plans that are the same way, correct? Uh, we do. Okay, so, um, which is, you know, something I think we need to be consistent, it would be nice if we're consistent across the board on that. Um, if we allowed a waiver of some sort, they're in a commercial zone, regardless of the specific plan they're in. Um, we could put, you know, because right now it says they can't be in that zone, that commercial zone. But if we allowed a possibility of a waiver, like we do with cannabis, they potentially could be. Not within the Section 14 specific plan. If we, but if we change the second Section 14 to be consistent with us, you know, we're changing them both. We yes, update it to be we, consistent. We could potentially do that. Okay. I, I will suggest that the Section 14 plan was done in uh, consultation with the tribe. Okay. Uh, and largely uh, done by their staff. Uh, and so I think we would need to have discussions with the tribal council uh, if we want to allow adult businesses within the Section 14 specific plan. That is perhaps distinct from the other specific plans we have, such as the downtown specific plan, where really only the city is the one who uh, reviews the regulations and can make modifications therein. Okay, great, it's doable. The other thing I was gonna ask is special events. Um, you know, the city of San Francisco, as an example, has many special events. Uh, where they do various things about um, nudity. I, I agree we need to update our nudity laws. Um, and we have special events, and you will find people wearing all kinds of things, even in our gay pride parade, right? And it's part of the celebration and the freedom of the body and the whole thing. So um, I, see the, I, I didn't see an, an, a section in here on special events. And I, I really don't want anyone to get arrested <laughs> for, you know, violating something uh, that's so commonly done um, already. What we might want to do, and uh, based on some of the suggestions and changes that are being proposed by council members, I see that we'll have to come back uh, for first reading again. Uh, these aren't simple changes that we can just do at second reading and adopt. Uh, so what I might recommend with that in terms of special events uh, if we're looking at making modifications to our public nudity ordinance, I believe that's the section where we would want to include that language, and we can look at other communities in terms of how they do that for their events. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Mayor. Council Member Kors. Thank you. Um, maybe we can, Mr. Ballinger can join us. Um, again, this is based on some of the public feedback I got. Um, including some folks who asked why we can't, would like to see us have less businesses. And I know you touched on the First Amendment for being specific. Can you touch about what the First Amendment requires of a municipality regarding adult-oriented businesses so the public's aware of that? Um, well, the primary um, requirements under the First Amendment are that we allow for adequate uh, opportunities for those businesses that are protected by the First Amendment. So. Um, traditionally, that's been, you know, adult bookstores, adult theaters, some of the things that uh, Mr. Fagg indicated um, have kind of uh, gone by the wayside uh, based on current market conditions. So you have to have uh, enough availability of, of land and spaces within the city for those uh, businesses to operate economically. Uh, and then also, uh, the First Amendment has been interpreted to require specificity. 
uh, as well as objectivity. So, um, you know, to the extent the council is interested in, in a waiver process, um, we're going to have to live by a higher standard than we are under, say, our cannabis ordinance, because cannabis has not been recognized as a First Amendment protected um, activity or product. <clears throat> so if the council gives us direction to come back with a waiver process, we're going to have to be uh, fairly objective so that we don't vest in anybody, whether it's a council or a commission or a city official, um, too much um, unbridled discretion is the term that courts have used. Those are the three main components of, of First Amendment protections. Great. Thank you. And the only other question, and maybe you can just correct me, but for we heard a public comment tonight, and I had one or two emails that this came out of nowhere, and we're trying to rush this in without anyone noticing it, you know, after the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, I think this has been on our council agenda planning six or eight months, if I'm correct, which we discuss at every council meeting. Um, and we had the first draft ordinance, I believe, the first week of September, at which point uh, we asked it be delayed for a couple of months to allow for more input. Is that correct? That's correct with regard to the adult business ordinance. And I, I do believe that um, questions have been raised from the dais during various uh, council member requests uh, over at least the three years that I've been here with regard to our nudity ordinance. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. A couple of questions uh, that I have, uh, and I'd like to go back to the map uh, that you showed us that was, th thank you. Uh, so currently uh, in the Sunny Dunes area, which is uh, the brownish color CM, uh, these types of activities are permitted, correct? That is correct. They are currently allowed okay, so in the area on the map on the left in right. the brown that's shown. And uh, if we were to adopt the changes that are proposed uh, in the staff report, you would add the adjacent areas that are labeled uh, C2? That is correct. And now nothing on Palm Canyon, though, would be eligible? Palm Canyon would be excluded. All right. Uh, so... Why are we uh, adding? I, sorry, I had questions about whether we were too restrictive in terms of the areas where these businesses could be located. Uh, and so based on that comment, uh, I looked at areas that might be good alternatives in perhaps expanding where adult businesses could be located. Uh, as I had mentioned, even expanding to the C2 zone and the highway commercial zone, it doesn't substantially add to the number of parcels, and I don't know that it, it benefits us. So I do have some familiarity with the Sunny Dunes uh, district. It is mine, uh, and uh, uh, not all of the uh, businesses there are locations are currently occupied, so we still have vacancies. Uh, have you run into issues of uh, applicants coming and simply not being able to find uh, a space that uh, they could operate their business where it is currently permitted? So we have had questions about where adult businesses could locate. Um, Council Member Woods has suggested uh, the building on Sunrise, the former gas building. And as I had mentioned, because it's in the Section 14 plan, adult businesses are not allowed there. Uh, and so obviously we had to indicate to an interested party that that would not be permissible in that location. Similarly, in the Sunny Dunes area where we have also had a request, and I believe there was a member of the public here this evening who cited a specific parcel that because of the residential separation requirements, even though it was an industrial parcel, could not locate the business there because it was too close to residential. Uh, which would be altered if we were to adopt uh, the not adjacent uh, standard for Sunny Dunes, is that correct? That is correct, either looking at the not adjacent standard or keeping the current separation distance in place but adopting a waiver standard instead. That is an incredibly unique uh, area, and uh, while I have many concerns about many parts of this proposed 
uh, ordinance, uh, I am not as concerned when it comes to a not adjacent standard in sunny dunes. Uh, moving on to the other map uh, where you're suggesting that we would add the HC uh, highly commercial zone. Uh, the M2 zone that's immediately adjacent, that is currently permitted uh, area? Yes, adult businesses would be permitted in the M2 area north of the freeway. Under current standards? Under current standards. Do we have any up there? No, we do not. Um, then I guess rhetorically I'm asking why would we uh, expand? And let me go beyond that. Uh, what s strikes me with grave concern regarding uh, adding in those areas is they are immediately adjacent to the freeway uh, and would f uh, formulate potentially uh, a very different uh, impression as individuals enter the city of Palm Springs. Yes, you will see that we do allow adult businesses there north of the freeway currently, okay. but adding them in the highway commercial district uh, may perhaps bring greater exposure even though they wouldn't be located directly on Indian Canyon. And, uh, and I know uh, that uh, there are limitations in terms of what we can do uh, in terms of restricting uh, advertising, but what adds to that is uh, uh, as one drives closer to where those establishments are going to be, uh, what we tend to have along the freeways is uh, uh, advertising, uh, making it clear where someone uh, can go, and that's a legal right, but uh, we're certainly changing the character of uh, the approach one has to the city of Palm Springs. And I think we need to be honest with ourselves that that is what we would be doing. Uh, if I could ask the police chief a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any concerns regarding uh, specifically the changes uh, that are being considered in essentially eliminating our public nudity uh, ordinance. So we get a lot of complaints from community members about activities, for instance, along Riverside Drive and the footbridge where um, people go to hook up and um, and sometimes occasionally are in dif dis different stages of dress that becomes a concern. So those are the kind of things that will make it very difficult uh, to enforce in a public space should there be a change. In addition to that, um, depending on what council decides to do in terms of um, the limitations of that and what gets changed, um, if it was full nudity, for instance, um, which I don't think anybody is at this point proposing, um, what would that mean uh, in adjacent to schools and public uh, right-of-ways? We've had uh, a number of special events, including most recently the Pride Parade. Uh, were there any arrests or any citations issued during the course of uh, Pride this year? There were not. So, all right. If I might, just to add one thing, Madam Mayor, and that is uh, we'd be happy to work with uh, Deputy City Manager um, to make sure that uh, the language is in a position that would, um, A, eliminate things that are currently illegal at the state level, uh, as and then in addition to making sure that uh, uh, it would protect the things that uh, the community deems important. And get it back to you that Thank way. You. Councilmember Halstead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just have a question on that. So do you find that the state law on nudity is insufficient and the city of Palm Spring needs to go above and beyond state law? And can you explain that? Sure. Under 314 of the penal code, it's a specific intent crime. Uh, in other words, that you're, you're using uh, um, your genitalia and exposed in a manner to for sexual arousal and that there's jury instructions that go with it as well as the state law so that 
In order for us to arrest somebody under the state law, they just could not be standing there naked, for instance. There has to be a sexual uh, intent behind it, and um, which is normally uh, a person masturbating in public or manipulating themselves uh, for the purpose of sexual arousal. So I do not find that for our purposes um, at this point uh, enough to make an arrest for somebody, for instance, sitting in a car um, outside of a school, uh, which we get occasionally um, to, to stop that kind of behavior. Thanks. So I'm just trying to understand that's really helpful and we want to make sure you have the tools that you need for those crimes. Um, but we also want to avoid sort of um, what Council Member Woods was alluding to, um, you know, um, things that are not crimes or that our community has been criminalized for that we no longer want to do. Um, so what uh, what do we need to add and what part of the public nudity that uh, ordinance that we have on the books now do we need to retain? Is, is it not being a specific, it's a general intent, that's what you need? Um, I think just the mere fact that somebody is, has exposed their entire genitalia uh, in a public place, uh, and then certainly council would need to decide, does that include um, the breast area for women, ex for example, uh, because you know, for men, it's permissible. For women, it's not, and we uh, and we understand uh, the concerns on that, as well as the buttocks region. Um, uh, to me, uh, the issue is: uh, Do we want somebody uh, exposing themselves to children? Uh, and and what does that also mean for public health? For instance, if you can be naked and walk into a restaurant and eat. Um, uh, so those become the issues that I guess that I would be uh, concerned about and to be articulate on and, and limiting uh, if possible. Thank you. Unless it's an adult-oriented restaurant, Flynn, right? Um, <laughs> no. So it's primarily... They serve food at the bar, right? <laughs> it's primarily genitalia is what I heard you say is primarily the concern. That's correct. Thank you. Are there other questions? Council Member Woods. Um, uh, just to uh, follow up on um, the mayor's comment, um, the signage, um, if I'm reading this correctly, the adult businesses along the freeway now still has to comply with our sign ordinance. Yes, yes they would it, need to comply with our sign ordinance. And we don't allow huge freeway signs, do we? Uh, the city of Palm Springs does not. However, okay. there are properties on tribal land, the tribe does allow billboards. Uh, so the billboards that you see existing are uh, generally on tribal land. And you have to, okay, but you know, to put a big sign up that says, you know, XXX with an arrow is not going to happen. Uh, no, so okay. off-premise advertising and any advertising would be subject to our sign ordinance. And on page um, two, um, uh, halfway down, there's three bullet points. I think it was just um, an oversight, but you have 10%. We're really talking about 20% and a change in the square footage is what, right? That just was an that oversight. That is correct, yes. There. And um, I think um, uh, Councilmember Holstage talked about state law. I, I think if somebody is sitting in a car um, naked, the only problem that I would see, and I'd ask the chief, is if they were in a state of sexual arousal, right? Then, then state law would allow you to arrest them. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions or should we move? Is it time to move on to comments? All right, let's move on to comments. And uh, uh, who would like to begin? Council Member Course. Sure. I mean, I think the questions really got to the issues. Um, you know, I, I think one thing is, and I understand your point, Mayor, on the police aren't arresting people, um, but it shouldn't still be on the books, right? And that's just, you know, and I think especially for, right, uh, both, you know, where thongs were banned for women, um, you know, shouldn't still be on the books. And we allow a lot of that now anyway. So we shouldn't have laws on, on the books for things that, Saying it's illegal when it really isn't. So 
I think we should need to clean it up for that. Um, and I think we need to have a better way of treating things equally, right? I think, you know, I mean, we know people are dancing nightly in jock straps, right, for entertainment and venues, but according to this, that would make them an adult business. So I, I, there's a lot more cleanup we need to do. This is a great start. I really appreciate all the work on this. Um, you know, so I was just trying to figure out, you know, are there things we can give clear direction on tonight or even decide tonight and other things that you need more time with? So maybe that will help guide what we do moving forward, if that makes sense. Because um, we don't want you to go back and then, you know, start over twice. So how can we help you? <laughs> so let me go through my discussion points. Um, the first one would be whether or not we want to expand to other zone districts, and I guess that's what I would like to get the direction from council on, as there's been questions, but I don't know that there's been clear direction on that point. Let me ask a question on that. So if we look at, I mean, I guess one, one point is, so the M2 zone, which also is on the freeway, do we have open buildings and no one's choosing to go there? We have both open buildings and open parcels. Okay. So that makes it seem that we don't necessarily need the HC zone at the moment, right? I think if we did for First Amendment reasons, you know, but given we have land that is not being used in a similar area, my inclination on that is not. Um, on the other one, because we're not allowing adjacent or across the street, we're only allowing very few more businesses, right? Um, but, you know, you have this one little section of Sunny Dunes, and do we necessarily want them all put in together there, right? So I'm more open to that, but we're talking, when you start looking at the adjacency issue and the um, across-the-street issue, it's probably five or less that could possibly be used. So, um, so I'm, I'm open to that one. Um, I'm not, it's not a, a major number more, but I'm, I'm open to it. So that's my view on those two, on that question, but we'll let other people weigh in. I, I can do some counting, and I think I'm going to be uh, in the minority on a couple of these things, uh, but I will not support uh, uh, any uh, extension of uh, into any new areas in the city. Okay, just a clarification, Flynn. Uh, are we putting any adult business would fit into that. So this is, so a retail store, for example, right, with more than 20% would also be excluded if we didn't allow it in that area. Correct. Right. Okay, just so I'm clear, we're talking about everything just so the public's aware of that. Um, I would support the expansion and I would support looking at an exemption for um, other zones. Um, I think we have enough rules and regulations in place that we could monitor its um, uh, use. And I think you talked about maybe even a CUP or just an exemption, however it works out with the city attorney for First Amendment rights. Okay. I also support um, ex Expansion is sort of a dramatic word for allowing consistent use in the same area with maybe five more parcels, but including the C2 zone um, and allowing a waiver um, process. Um, I'm persuaded by the mayor's comments about the HC zone and the impact on the, I'm trying to make sure I say this in a First Amendment friendly way where we're um, required to allow all types of businesses in, in certain areas, but I'm not expanding to the HC zone at this time. I'm open to it. Initially, I um, was open to, and I am open to expanding to C1 as well with a um, CUP process, um, but hearing from city staff that that's not recommended because it really isn't. Though it sounds like I'm not proposing this, but I know other cities do allow on their frontage. So is that just a Palm Springs or some cities don't allow on frontage? I know like Santa Barbara has some adult-oriented businesses on their main street, on State Street there. This is one that varies from community to community just based on community standards. Right. Um, so in Palm Springs, yeah, we 
are a little bit unique in terms of not allowing it on primary right. and secondaries. And my understanding is just Palm Springs is so restrictive on a lot of this stuff because of those ordinances or the changes that happened in the 90s and before, and that's why I support um, opening it up more broadly. Um, so that's where I'm at. The next discussion point, unless there's... Oh, sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the C2 zone considering it's just a few areas. It's a pretty minor change um, and it's consistent with what's already in that area. Again, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so noted. Uh, the next discussion point for City Council is relative to separation distances. Uh, do you want to modify the separation distance from residential? or would you prefer having a waiver process put in place? I ask a question on that? Um, so I thought it was not adjacent to versus, is that what, you know, that's what we're looking at. To Correct. Except not adjacent to. So in a couple cases along the wash, you know, there's quite a distance between the Sunny Dunes area and residential, even though the distance may not be there. So um, I would support that aspect of it. And I'll let the rest talk. Yeah, I agree with your staff recommendation. Right. I do as well. I can support uh, in Sunny Dunes, uh, not adjacent. We've got the wash. We've got a very unique uh, area there. Uh, okay. Or a waiver process. One of the advantages of the waiver process is everyone uh, gets to weigh in. I'm fine with not adjacent. And I can support uh, uh, the type of facility that uh, uh, Mr. Thorne uh, operates in Los Angeles in that uh, what we have clearly found is that brings activity indoors that far too often is taking place outdoors uh, and in public places. And then finally, I think um, the public nudity ordinance, we've taken all of your comments down. What we will do is we will make modifications. We'll consult with the police chief uh, as well as reviewing other ordinances from local communities as well. And we'll come back with some modifications to our existing ordinance and give you that language to look at. If I could, in respect to my colleagues and uh, to the staff and all of the work that's gone into this, uh, I have very severe concerns regarding uh, the direction that uh, uh, we're proceeding. We're not taking a vote this evening. That will come back at a later date. And I appreciate uh, the uh, uh, effort to accommodate some of my concerns. Uh, I do not want to mislead anyone. Uh, it is very unlikely that I will vote uh, in favor of this ordinance when it comes back. Uh, I, I think we are going f too far, too fast. Yeah, Councilman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's hard to follow that with my specific question. Um, but when you bring it back, um, I might be here, I might not. Um, but could you consider if breastfeeding is currently illegal under our public nudity ordinance? Because I believe it might be in the way that it defines female breasts. Thank you. Council member, our Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. So in terms of the public nudity ordinance, we are trying to not eliminate it and go under state law, but have a balance, right? Is that what I'm hearing from everyone? I mean, I, I will say that yes, I've please. certainly had experiences that would not fall under the state penal code here in Palm Springs, but still made me very deeply uncomfortable <laughs> um, and was clearly meant as harassment in the case that I I experienced. So I would want to make sure that things like that were covered in any instance that any law or ordinance that we had. So I think there is um, room for, for that. Okay. 
Madam Mayor, based oh, unless there's any additional comments, I think we have our direction. Okay. Uh, there is no vote required as we will need to come back with amendments uh, at a first reading. Can I add a couple of comments sure. just to make sure that we're um, on page 13? I think we've all talked about the one through eight and how they apply. Um, page, 14. page 14, excuse me, the one through eight and how they apply and if they're even relevant today. And uh, I think the mayor talked about pedophilia and changing that, but I, I really want to know more about how that applies. We talked about special events as well. Uh, and then on page 16, number 13, adult oriented business shall not display any sexual oriented material. I'm not clear what that means. Um, you know, we have several of them currently, several um, novelty shops on Palm Canyon. We have um, uh, Hollywood just opened up on Takwitz. Um, what is and what isn't is uh, a harness is a paddle, is any of that sexually oriented or is it, you know, just be very clear or is it something that's more insertive that we're, we're concerned about? I know. If I can, it says it on page 14 that we didn't talk about. It's the paragraph before that list, but I agree that also needs to be updated with modern, medically accurate terminology that isn't what it currently has. Council member, of course. Yeah, and also on page four. Yeah, uh, I know we, we so, you're going to update all the terminology, which is appreciated. And then I think the, your idea on the best way to bring back sort of the two under specified anatomical parts, um, and maybe it's just bring back options. So on first reading, council, whether us or in, in the next council, has options to consider, right? Um, Council Member Horstage. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor. And I, I hear that the mayor is um, has a differing view on this. Um, what I heard, or at least what I might propose, if the council majority of council supports for the public nudity ordinance, so um, modifying our existing Palm Springs ordinance um, and leaving it so that we have one, um, but just specific to what the police chief advises he needs in terms of um, genitals and excluding um, the, you know, female breasts or buttocks when it's not used in a sexually suggestive, ma sexual manner, however you want to define it, if that works for the chief and for the council. Is that your recollection of the direction on the public nudity ordinance? Thank you. And if I can lastly add uh, um, a BDSM, um and its connotations. Obviously, um, we have a lot of bachelorette parties here in the city of Palm Springs. Fifty Shades of Grey is incredibly popular, um, and I don't know as it, it holds up today as it did maybe in the past. And you're noting that because in that paragraph on page 14, it actually lists some BDSM materials as sexually oriented merchandise, which we can d debate and you can advise us if that should be included or not. Correct. You mentioned, great. All right. Uh, staff, do you have the direction that you need this oh. evening? Yes, we do. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Is there anyone on council who has anything further? All right. And I think we've uh, talk through this issue. Uh, we've been at uh, this pretty intensely for three hours. Maybe a 15 minute break would be appropriate uh, and start back at 845. Thank you.
and we will return to uh, the city council meeting. We did change the order uh, to address item 3D before we address item 3C. Uh, and may I have a staff report, please? Absolutely. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. Uh, it's great to be back in front of you so soon. Um, I am going to talk you through an update on progress toward climate action, um, which I know uh, updates on various items have been requested by the Council um, over the past couple of months. I'm pleased to kind of report, you know, both what I've been up to and what I know. I will admit off the top that there are certain things I know a lot about and certain things I don't know very much about <laughs> <laughs> because four months is not quite enough time to delve into all of the issues yet, um, but we'll do my best um, to answer with what I know and, and get back to you with anything that I may learn here this evening. So um, it's a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna do my best to kind of go through it at a normal speed, not too fast, um, kind of in one go. Um, so that way you can kind of see the, the full total, but happy to jump around, take questions, um, and discuss anything in particular that you might want to know more about. Um, so I want to kind of start off just by positioning where we are just kind of locally and nationally and internationally a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about progress to date, both specifically on the council's priorities around climate and environmental action, um, and then also on the climate action roadmap, which those two things are very closely intertwined, but have a couple of key differences. Um, then talk about kind of how I and the team hope to spend the first bit of 2023, which particular things we want to focus on, just as a highlight, you know, not, a, not as an exclusive, but just kind of as a preview. Um, and then kind of spend a little bit of time talking about enforcement in particular. Um, so I know uh, we want to talk a little bit about leaf blowers and just kind of hear where the council is thinking on a couple of issues there for some, some direction. But um, because, you know, issues around enforcement will always come up. So I wanted to kind of dive in on those a little bit. So um, without further ado, I also love really bright colors on slides. So um, hopefully that's not too dizzying. Um, so there's kind of four ways that I've been thinking about you know, how, do, how we situate our priorities these days. So um, the first that I wanna highlight here is progress locally. So, you know, thanks to the efforts of this and previous councils, um, current and previous city staff, um, really the city of Palm Springs both has firmly established its reputation as a leader in climate action in the environmental space, but continues to uphold that. So, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight here, um, you know, is, uh, and then also not to, to uh, miss the contributions of our Sustainability Commission as well, um, some members of whom have joined us tonight. Um, so the city of Palm Springs is actually on target with its goals. Um, this is not common uh, in municipalities to hit goals on time when it comes to climate action. Um, the city of Palm Springs has actually done so. Um, so I believe when you, when you discussed the climate action roadmap last year, um, you were able to dig into the fact that we did reach our 2020 goal on time, which was to hit 1990 emissions levels, which is roughly 500,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, the main reason that this was able to happen was desert community energy coming online and taking 20% of our emissions out in one fell swoop. Um, I think I may have mentioned this last time, that does not happen <laughs> normally. Um, that is a you know, real testament, I think, to the, the courage and innovation of everyone uh, who has been part of this process in the city. So, um, so it's great that we've met those goals. Um, and so I think we're starting on a really strong footing. Um, however, um, we, that does not obviate the continued need for continued action at the local state, national, international level. We will need all of the tools at our disposal um, to continue to meet this crisis head on. And so one of the things that I know this council and our commission looked at over the summer is our vulnerability assessment update. Um, so the latest vulnerability assessment, as you all probably remember, um, has Palm Springs reaching 25 days a year above 120 degrees by 2050. Um, which is, I mean, just kind of mind boggling, especially when we think about everything from extreme heat impacts. You know, we do have a, an older population here in Palm Springs who tend to bear those impacts the most firmly. Um, you know, our, you know, what we do here in Palm Springs also has ripple effects around the valley and around the region. Um, so, you know, we're going to continue, you know, when we think about hitting our 1990 goal, that's great. Our 2030 goal is 40 more percent emissions reduction. So we have a lot of work to do, though we are on really strong footing to be able to do it. Um, state goals. So the state has also recently increased its goals in line with updated climate science. So um, the state is now targeting uh, carbon neutrality five years earlier. So now by 2045, um, this, uh, the governor has some executive orders that push from 40% emissions reductions by 2030 to a target of 48%. Um, so a lot of, and I'll talk a little bit about this later in the presentation. A lot of what we do here is, is interconnected with what's happening regionally because there are certain things within our jurisdiction, certain things outside of it. Um, so making sure that we're 
we're in good coordination with those different bodies continues to be very important so we can understand who's going to move on what, who helps whom with what, who needs to do what when. Um, so the state will continue to, to set a good baseline framework for us, I think. So we'll have some things that we need to do to hit that target, but they them hitting that target will also help us hit our targets. Um, and then federally, you know, this is a change from the past few years. There's a very rosy federal landscape, at least for the foreseeable future from um, the IRA and the IAJA, there's going to be an unprecedented amount of federal funding available, um, largely that's being distributed through states, um, but that uh, regions and localities will have a pretty large um, size of that pie as well. And then there will also be incentives that will just be available to people in general. Um, so figuring out how we help residents, visitors, community members take advantage of those will be of utmost importance. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, just to kind of spend a little bit of time on framing, so this is these are the council's climate priorities, um, priority number two, um, which is a full 25% of the priorities, which I'm very grateful for, um, gives us a lot of runway and a lot of specific action to do. So the extraordinary level of specificity, I think, that these plans have in Palm Springs gives us also a really strong footing, um, you know, it being very cognizant of what is within our tool set here to do as a municipality um, and things that can happen now so that it's easy for us to take these bigger actions later. Um, um, so I want to just kind of talk through very quickly um, what these generally are, and I'll get into more detail on these later on. Um, so the first piece here, accelerating uh, implementation of our climate action plan or roadmap. Um, so uh, thankful for the council and staff support on budgeting for additional FTEs. We are in the process of hiring new staff as well. Um, so this, you know, this, the team of, of temporarily one will become a team of three, hopefully uh, right around the beginning of the new year, which will be very helpful. Um, completing greenhouse gas emission analysis. So the city does do like every two years or so some pretty robust greenhouse gas emission analysis. This continues to be very important. Um, we also want to incorporate um, some of the findings of the updated general plan, some of those updated projections as we refine our 2030 um, action plans for hitting city emission carbon neutrality and then regional carbon neutrality by 2045 in line with the state. Um, and uh, targeting high value projects. Uh, we'll talk a lot about high value projects later. Um, so considering new policies, so uh, Senate Bill 1383, um, which you all spent a lot of time looking at the update to our waste management franchise to accomplish that, that looks at short-lived climate pollutants, also known as methane or um, other climate pollutants that are generated um, from short-term decay as opposed to carbon emissions or, you know, CO2 emissions, which are kind of based on longer-term time processes. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Desert community energy we already touched on. Um, com commercial renewable energy standards we'll talk about in our high value projects. Um, community composting I think we can talk a little bit about as well. That's an interesting one to think about in the context of Senate Bill 1383. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit in the next slide about kind of how I think about the ways that we bring residents into climate action. I still think community composting is very important um, as a way to bring residents to the table and um, help them understand what their role is in local environmental action. Um, and uh, clarifying land conservation goals. I know there's been a lot of great work locally, you know, by nonprofits, by other organizations, um, thinking about land conservation here, um, both in Palm Springs and in the Coachella Valley in general. Um, so that's something that, that we hope to dig into a little bit more next year as well. Um, and then finally, thinking about um, kind of standardizing and building more policies. So one of the things that I often try to think about is how I work myself out of a job. Um, so the idea that sustainability becomes because it is so integral to all of the different functions that a municipality has, especially in the year 2022, thinking about um, continued survival of our species, you know, how does how do we continue and how can I and my team continue to empower other departments to center sustainability, emissions reductions, and longer term planning in their operations? So thinking through um, how we can integrate into other processes, which we've already started to do, and I know past staff have done a great job of setting that framework. Um, you know, where are the other levers that we need to be pushing to really be thinking holistically about all of the ways that we can reduce emissions, waste, pollution, things like that. Um, so integrating sustainability with other departments is, is the number one thing listed in this third column here. Um, we'll talk about some specifics there later on. And then more specifically, green purchasing policies we'll also talk about um, in sort of late 22, early 23 work. Um, I also love a rule of threes, so you'll see three columns an awful lot in this presentation. Um, so um, when I kind of think about the ways that I have come to understand the, the climate work here in Palm Springs in particular, I think about it kind of along three vectors. Um, so the first being empowering residents and visitors. So this is the bread and butter of sustainability work. So this is the kind of things that um, when you think about, um, you know, when people encounter 
environmental challenges often. It's you think about gardens, landscaping, recycling, um, you know, what do I do with my sharps? Like, you know, various kind of questions where this is kind of where people are encountering almost environmental operations the most frequently. Um, and so really proud of the work that we've been able to continue to build on um, that the team has established here, um, you know, offering quarterly e-waste and shredding events, which continue to be very popular, um, uh, establishing um, the demonstration garden over at the airport, which I had the chance to see this morning um, on my way out of there. It's looking great. I recommend you go take a look. I'm hoping to get some signage over there soon so we can do a formal opening. Um, and then updating EV charging um, and making sure that's available throughout the city. So the city does have a very robust network, both of kind of upgraded, very shiny EV chargers, and then kind of the, the older models, which we have available for free use as well still. Um, so we have charging available at a variety of different price points, a variety of different charging levels, and in a lot of different locations around the city where people would want to use them. Um, that's something that we'll talk about what that phase two looks like here in a little bit. Um, but that's some great work that's been done over the past couple of years um, by the council, the commission, and staff. Um, so the second here is kind of thinking about who are who's on our team. Um, so you know we want to make sure that residents see themselves kind of in that first column as empowered to take climate action. And then who are the other members and other organizations and collectives that we're working with to kind of make this work happen? Um, so collaborating with businesses, communities in the region. One of the examples of that I think is the extraordinary leadership that a lot of our members of our business community have shown around the foodware ordinance. Um, so that is something that the council passed to phase out single-use plastics and other disposable items, um, long-lived disposable items like eternal styrofoam. Um, that's something that um, we've seen a lot of res or a lot of restaurants really take up very well, which is great. Um, we've also offered some incentives to help restaurants and businesses adopt the food ordinance. Um, we've also seen. Um, some residents or some businesses not adopt the foodware ordinance, um, which is that something that um, I'm on. I'm on a styrofoam hunt right now, and I'm very quickly going to become very unpopular in a lot of local restaurants. But I'm new, so it's okay. Um, so that's something that I do want to, you know, kind of think about how we continue to leverage that success, um, and then collaborating with you know regional organizations like CVAG. I think the CV Link is a really good example of kind of regional transportation collaboration, helping to improve bike access throughout. Um, throughout Palm Springs and throughout the region, kind of thinking about that networked connectivity um, and how we're using that to get more people thinking about um, non-vehicular modes of transportation. Um, and then finally, thinking about system transformation. So you could almost read these columns also the other direction, um, kind of thinking about the system transformation as providing that baseline or foundation on which we build the additional you know, collaboration with community, both in the business and community, business and neighborhoods, and then also residential. Um, so um, you know, obviously DCE, we've talked about a little bit kind of being at the top of this list here. Um, also rolling out residential organics collection, which I don't want to understate the size of that feat uh, that Palm Springs Disposal has undertaken. Um, it's something that when I was in New York, we worried about for two and a half years. Um, and I know that, that PSDS has been planning around that same amount of time. Um, but I think, you know, so far managing to get all of those bins out and get that service started. I know we're, we're still kind of working through the uptake, but um, it's, it's going pretty well so far in my opinion. Um, and then also uh, thanking the council and team for support of their growth of the Office of Sustainability and other programs around sustainability in the city, which I think has been very helpful in setting the foundation for all of this additional work. So time to talk about what that additional work looks like. Um, so there's four um, topics that I want to dive into a little bit here um, in terms of where I think, um, you know, in collaboration with other teams, you know, the commission, other other and other agencies and organizations, um, where I think our opportunity areas are next in terms of what's in our climate action roadmap and in our council priorities. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about here is EV charging. So I'm thinking about EV charging in two ways. One is how do we go ahead and eliminate our fleet and city transportation as a source of carbon emissions? Um, so this is something where I think we can take advantage of a lot of federal and state funding that's gonna be available here. Um, and it's also something that's largely within our control. So, you know, we do have a very robust planning appar or apparatus around replacement cycles. Um, so we're already, you know, working very closely with our fleet team um, who is ready to go electric as soon as the infrastructure is there. So this is a classic chicken and egg problem. Um, you know, when do you put in the charging stations? How many do you put in? How much money does that cost to upgrade the service from Southern California Edison? How long will that take? Um, so that planning process, I think, is something that's very high priority for us because we kind of just want to, you know, cross that off of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and get that out of the way. Um, so excited to be able to hopefully exceed our carb mandated goals for vehicle replacement, which I believe is starting in 2024 
10% of our fleet that we replace annually needs to be zero emission. Um, and that's focusing on light duty vehicles. Um, so we don't necessarily have to get the specialized airport de-icing trucks electric on, in 2024, which is good because those don't exist, um, but starting to work toward replacement of those available vehicles soon. And I know um, the council has also supported adoption of a few electric vehicles uh, in this fiscal year. So the team is working on bringing those on. We have a few in the fleet, um, but you know, out of, our, out of our total vehicles, it's still a relatively small percentage, largely because we're a little bit limited on the infrastructure, but looking at some options to be able to roll that out. And then also when I'm thinking about EV charging with the team um, is looking at making sure we have good coverage throughout the city. Um, so we have really good penetration downtown. Um, we want to continue to you know, expand that to any, basically any city owned lots. We want those to have you know, the, the hottest, newest, latest EV chargers that people can easily use and integrate in with the systems that they're already using. Um, but that's, you know, that's not necessarily everywhere in the city. We want to make sure those continue to be available at a variety of price points because also as more used EVs become available, as more tax credits become available, we don't want access to charging and paying for charging to be a, a barrier to someone being able to adopt this type of transportation mode. Um, so thinking about making sure we have kind of like that premium service, maybe that's, you know, the fast chargers that are maybe a little bit more expensive. Um, and then also kind of the backbone service where anyone can go get some charge for two to three hours for free, for free to kind of help them get around town that way. Um, so EV charging, um, that continues to, to be a high priority because transportation emissions are the largest sector of our emissions portfolio. Um, this is true of all California cities, um, but it, it is the, you know, our largest segment. It's also tricky to reduce transportation emissions relative to other types because there are so many players involved, like there's state road regulators, local road regulations, um, there's, you know, federal laws that we can and cannot run afoul of, um, sorry, uh, city attorney Ballinger, I will not do that. Um, but you know, like we can't restrict certain kinds of vehicles in certain places, things like that. Um, which I could talk about for hours if anyone is really bored. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on EV charging and what we're looking forward to doing next. Um, really leveraging, I think, public-private partnerships and collaborations with the business communities here as well. Um, so we do have a 10-year license agreement in place for um, operation of our charge point stations, um, and that gives us access to add other types of stations and other facilities at little to no cost to the city, which I think is a great foundation. Uh, mobility survey and planning. So. Um, there's not enough lithium in the world for us to replace every gas car with an electric car and hope for the best. Um, so I think we really need to be thinking about multimodal transportation, which I know this council has, has talked a lot about. You know, how do we make those different transportation modes more welcoming, um, more inviting? Um, so I think really what our commission and uh, other members of the community have identified is a bit of a data gap here. So we're starting by remedying a data gap, um, by understanding um, how people would like to move around the city, how they do move around the city, what are kind of the reasons why they choose to do or not do certain things. Um, we're hoping to use some of that data to help us identify some targeted investments um, and uh, help build more community support for additional things like more bike lanes. Um, maybe if we're thinking about bike share, you know, I think we need a little bit more data before we would want to do something like that um, to understand where that might go. What kinds of bike share models would we look at? Those are just some examples that I'm throwing out. Um, we'd also would love to, you know, have things be a little bit more pedestrian friendly, um, more shade, you know, kind of get people walking in more places as well. So this is kind of how we're thinking about a holistic transportation strategy, which is supporting the work of engineering, planning, all these other departments as well. Um, so that's some, some data gap work that we'll be working to remedy um, in collaboration with a lot of community members in the beginning of 2023. Um, and then switching gears off of transportation a little bit. So um, the city impact, I touched on this a little bit when I talked about the fleet work. Um, it is uniquely within our control um, to you know, reduce emissions within the city. Um, you know, The city of Palm Springs being the size that it is, our emissions are not as large of a segment of our total emissions as other cities might be, who might have more advanced industrial processes that they're running as their city government. Um, but we still are responsible for a fairly significant amount of environmental impact and emissions impact. Um, and we wanna continue to lead by example. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're really hoping to do um, to support the work of our, our sister departments. Um, so one is really thinking about the turf conversion master plan, which I know is mentioned both in our uh, climate action roadmap and in the council's priorities, um, making sure that we have a kind of a, a plan to phase out the rest of our, you know, major water hogging non-functional turf. So that's something where we'll be working to support 
parks, public works um, in developing those plans as they're working on those. Um, and then also finally implementing our environmentally preferable purchasing policy, um, which I was very glad to know in Palm Springs, which our, our basically final draft is less than 20 pages as opposed to the 750 page one that we had in New York, which was not useful because it was so long. Um, so this is much better. Um, so looking forward to uh, bringing that back uh, probably for the next council at the beginning of their tenure to finalize that. I know this council's had a lot of great impact and, uh, and support of that. And then the final kind of uh, project dive I want to do here a little bit, um, you know, I'm going to do my best not to misspeak in front of our techn technical expert, Commissioner David Freeman, who is here in the audience to support with any questions that I may not be able to answer. Um, but thinking about some new ordinances here, and so this is something that I know um, the council has provided some direction on. Um, we're able to kind of take a few steps in advance of the bleeding edge here um, with two primary goals. So one is reducing the environmental and emissions impact of commercial buildings. So whether that is new building or new commercial or existing, um, making sure that they're using uh, as clean of electricity as possible. So hopefully 100% renewable um, and then continuing to reduce the amount of that electricity that they demand by imp uh, improving their energy efficiency on site. Um, so there's some ordinances that have been drafted around that. Um, and then also making sure that our residential buildings come that are existing because we have so many in Palm Springs that are of some wonderful architectural eras that were not great about insulating, um, making sure that we're kind of bringing everybody up to a consistent baseline um, that is consistent with um, the current energy codes. Um, so there's we're kind of in a stakeholder outreach phase here. I think we have really good, um, really good frameworks for our resolution or for the ordinances. I think, you know, things are pretty clearly drafted, but I think we're in the implementation and understanding phase. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to do in the beginning of next year and, and bring back early to the next council as well. Um, just making sure that those feel feasible. We understand kind of specifics around cost benefit, phase and timelines, things like that. We're also going to be really big beneficiaries, particularly here from federal and state funding. Um, so this is kind of a situation where I think our, we'll kind of be optimizing timing a little bit. So there will be significant tax credits, incentives, um, things, rebates available for things like heat pumps, which are like the electric next generation version of your HVAC system, of e home EV charging equipment, of induction cook stoves. Um, we wanna make sure that we both have the tools that are encouraging people to take advantage of these opportunities um, because it is gonna be relatively limited time, probably these things will be available. So we want people to be taking advantage of these credits. Um, we want people to have also the technical assistance resources in order to do that. So thinking about both how we can fill that in as a city. Um, I know CVAG uh, and other colleagues have been working a lot on establishing the Inland Renewable Energy Network, which is sort of a uh, kind of like a, a a, a network that can take advantage of ratepayer funding from the California Public Utilities Commission and reinvest that in technical assistance and other programs locally, um, which will also be very helpful. So we really want to kind of maximize this opportunity by bringing a lot of things together at once. So that is the end of uh, my upcoming projects uh, sort of discussion. I uh, want to talk a little bit here about enforcement because while this is a very specific close reading here, it's kind of there are principles here that apply to many of the other things that we want to do as a city. So I'm um, thinking about leaf blowers. So I have to admit, I uh, have nev had never touched a leaf blower before I came to Palm Springs because I lived in a city for my entire adult life. So this has been really interesting for me to learn about. Um, so. I, you know, I know this council has, has heard a few times a few discussions on kind of where I think the enforcement, or not the enforcement issues, but the, the kind of adoption of the ordinance kind of is, has plateaued. Um, so I think, you know, based on what we've seen uh, both in seasonal variation and just kind of neighborhood, time of day, things like that, we see between 50 and 75% compliance with the, this ordinance, we estimate. Um, it is impossible to catch every leaf blower. It is possible, but not always easy to audibly discern the difference between different types of loop blowers, though I know our, our compliance officers are very good at making that determination, um, and I have a lot of respect for their ability to do that. Um, so it kind of just depends, you know, summer you see a little bit less because the batteries tend to drain faster in the heat, which I know is an issue that's been discussed before, um, and, you know, different neighborhoods, kind of depending on who's landscaping where, and, you know, there, there can be a bit of a snowball effect if, you know, you have enough people using a gas leaf blower and they feel like it's okay, then you kind of see more people start to use it. But we do see, I would say, pretty significant compliance with this, but it's not perfect. Um, we're also seeing a change in 
kind of how landscapers are using their leaf blowers. Um, so people will have, you know, multiple, multiple leaf blowers on them. They'll have an electric one and a gas one. They use the electric one out front and the gas one in the back. Like, you know, there's kind of, there's a reluctance to kind of give up on the, on the tried and true equipment that, that can be perceived as more efficient, especially for larger scale, more industrial operations where you might be going from property to property and you can't necessarily maintain the battery charge. Um, so this, you know, these, these problems that have existed continue to exist. Um, however, we do have two pieces of changing context here. Um, so one is a decision from code compliance that we've talked about um, where they're now going to be issuing citations to the homeowner instead of the landscaper. Um, so it can be difficult to find the landscapers in some in instances based on where, you know, wh whose truck they're using. Maybe it's not labeled. Um, so uh, that's a that's a new change that uh, that code compliance thinks will generate more compliance with the ordinance if the um, if the citation is going to the property owner. Um, the second piece here being a change in California state law. So starting in 2024, you will no longer be able to purchase a gas powered leaf blower or lawn, uh, lawn mower in the state of California. Um, this will not make it impossible for people to acquire these pieces of equipment, but it will make it more difficult, um, especially for people who might be, you know, buying one piece, you know, to use at home or something like that. Um, so I think we have a couple of options that we've been thinking about, but we would love the council's feedback on moving forward. Um, so, you know, what we have seen be very effective here is our education and rebate and trade-in programs that we've offered. So we do still offer our rebate program. Um, you know, we've been considering doing another round of marketing outreach kind of communications around the rebate program that exists, um, which offers, I believe, up to $750 to replace um, your leaf blower. Um, you know, there, we also have not done any trade-in programs in a while, but I know the trade-in programs were very popular when the ordinance was first launched. Um, also thinking about different pressure points at which we could apply education. So maybe it's at licensure for the businesses. Um, maybe it's kind of having more opportunities to, you know, co-create, I guess, almost like a future pathway with, um, with landscapers, um, with the acknowledgement that the new California state law will continue to apply downward pressure, I think, on the number of leaf blowers that we see. Um, but we are still kind of in that, you know, sort of mid-range compliance phase. And that's it. So that was a million different topics um, very quickly. <laughs> and I am very happy to spend as much time as anyone would like on any one of those topics or on any topics that may not have appeared. So thank you for your time. So this is a uh, report to us uh, that uh, we'll ultimately receive and file and provide some uh, direction going forward. Uh, so uh, I think comments and questions can be combined pretty easily in this for an agenda item such as this. So, uh, I'm not sure who would like to begin first, but uh, Council Member Kors. Since no one else is jumping, first thank you for the great report. Um, a lot of information, a lot of great work, so thank you. Um, I like the colors. Okay. I also appreciate the speed of your presentation Excellent. because you got through a lot of information in a reasonable amount of time. So um, just a couple of comments. One is, you know, when we sort of the goals in here of like 80 or 90 percent carbon neutral by 2050. I mean, yep. we talked about 2030, not just for city right. facilities. Right, got it. Right, we talked yep. about it for the city, mm -hmm. which a lot That's of small right. cities are now doing. We used examples of the cities, if I remember Councilmember Holstage, mm -hmm. um, as that. And it was mm -hmm. supposed to come back, I think, in a resolution or something which might have been helpful. So maybe we just need to bring that back or not. But it was for the city. Mm -hmm. And so even when we we're doing the budget, we talked, given that, we had to put money away and we need a really ambitious plan if we have any hope of making it. With mm -hmm. DCE, it gives us some potential. Yep. But the goal is stronger than that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Not waiting past the state to get sure. where we need to get. Um, on leaf blowers, um, we're at least five years from when that ordinance was passed because you weren't on the council. Yeah, it was 29. I'm the only one who was on the council when that was passed. Um, and we're still getting hundreds of complaints. I appreciate at least half, if not more, in compliance. I do hear. Um, from some people who complain regularly. Um, so I know you get more than one from some folks. Um, and even, you know, talking to my landscaper who did it right away feels it's so unfair for the people who follow the law that right. they feel the city's not following the law for the people who are breaking it. And so I appreciate uh, code compliance is going to start focusing on the homeowners, which I do think is a much better way to do it. Um, and I also think the idea of really upping the education, which we did early on with the rebates, mm -hmm. and even if we need to put some more money in the rebates to help people buy them, 
um, makes a lot of sense, right? And uh, so, okay. you know, I, I thought those were good good ways to do it. I think, you know, if we need if the cost is a factor for folks, I think we can put more money into that rebate, mm -hmm. um, given no one's using it currently. Um, and I think we just need to do more of the fairs that we did, right, where we had a couple hundred people come um, and really up that education level. Because it's, you know, it's not just climate, right, although they're incredibly, you know, polluting. But it's the noise. A lot of the hotels were so happy. Their guests are mm -hmm. happy, right? You know, and, and the health impacts of breathing on all the gas on the workers yeah, that absolutely. are also concerned. So, um, so getting that education out and the rebate going, I think, would really be, be helpful okay. um, to do that. Okay. And I think we do know when, with the repeated violations, you know, what time we have an issue at that house, mm -hmm. right? So, right. you know, we're very effective with, you know, um, vacation rentals. I think we may not get it the first time, but if you're getting repeated mm -hmm. at the same time, and I don't want to find someone the first time, but it should be a warning, here's the rebate, you know, right. et cetera. Um, and I think the homeowners are the appropriate because often they'll go get an electric powered leaf flower. Sure. Yeah, and I think it's helpful. great the state is going to ban the sale of them, but we could be 10 years of older, right. <laughs> worse leaf blowers still out there. Or just driving um, to Arizona. Right. Uh, but really appreciate all the work, and I, um, and I look forward uh, when I'm off the council to see sort of the next phase uh, of moving us forward. The last thing I just wanted to comment on was um, before you were here, mm -hmm. I believe, because um, it was probably in the spring, we had a meeting with our communications and Desert Community Energy and Tourism and the Convention Center and our Hospitality Association and Visit Greater Palm Springs about um, doing a lot to recognize all the businesses that are 100% carbon free sure. and promoting them, promoting that our convention center is 100% carbon free, which our convention center didn't know at the time, um, to conventions <laughs> because sure. they can then market it. Yeah, totally. And one, you know, the national studies um, that we have at Visit Greater Palm Springs show that for um, tourists 40 and under, the sustainability of a location is always in the top three reasons they choose somewhere. So we should be promoting the businesses who are doing the right thing. We should be promoting this as a place that is ahead on these issues. Uh, so I just want to make sure, and I'm happy to be part of a follow-up meeting, sure. that we get that back it just, you know, fell off as things do when there are a hundred other things going on. But get that going, back going again. So I, I can see if I have notes. And, but this reminded me that we needed to do that. Sure, so. absolutely. That's great. Great. Thanks again. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Other comments? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this and for all of the work. Um, so transportation is the biggest issue here. Right. Um, and I would really... You know, in, in talking with um, other residents and Roy Clark, who's one of our former um, sustainability commissioners, I think it would be great to have um, a transportation strategic plan. You know, you've already mentioned a couple of different things with the fleet, um, but you know, we have an opportunity to really make Palm Springs a, a walkable destination for our tourists sure. specifically. I mean, that's the easiest thing. Uh, obviously, we want it to be more walkable for our residents as well. Um, but things like having an airport shuttle, potentially having the buzz come back um, to bring people to popular destinations. Um, there's a lot of opportunities here. And to be able to create a task force that's limited in, limited in scope to transportation issues and how it impacts the climate action plan um, and includes staff and residents to really dig in on this, I think would be helpful because there's a lot of stuff that we can do when we need to actually know what is the top priorities and how quickly can we implement them. Like we have our, our safe routes to school already, we have our pedestrian safety plan, we have all of these things, but we don't have a timeline of when those things are going to be implemented. So really being able to bring in all of these different transportation discussions and identify um, the top goals and timelines for implementation, I think, would be really helpful. Um, for instance, the fleet uh, electrification we've talked about 
for a while now, but it's it's really, like you've said, in, in the future, because we, in 2019, one of the first things that we voted on was buying, I don't know how many new cars, all gas. Mm -hmm. So we're, we You're don't welcome. even need any new cars for the foreseeable future. So what are other things that we we can do? And, and, and certainly putting in electric charging stations at um, multifamily units and other places that don't have them, you know, off getting our condo associations to put them in place. And, you know, like you said, making right. it as easy as possible. Apologies if I'm repeating some things. No, no, I was no. having like some no, allergy great. issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had to run out a couple times. Um, yeah, and, and I think that, you know, we have a really great opportunity right now, especially with the CVB hiring a sustainability person, you know, really dedicated to this stuff to, to make this something that we're really working on regionally um, and doing that advertising, making sure that people understand that we are a green destination uh, and, and what we have to offer. Um, I really, I've said this multiple times, we, you don't have to, you don't need a car if you're coming to Palm Springs, you really don't. But I think that it's the default and being able to really show people that you can come to Palm Springs and never rent a car, um, I think would be something that could really benefit us in terms of reducing emissions. Um, probably, I don't know, probably fairly dramatically. I think of how many people come in mm -hmm. because of cars um, compared to how our residents who really don't drive that much, sure. <laughs> right? Well, it's also interesting in those cases to think about like when we, I think one of the things we're hoping to do when we do our mobility surveying is thinking about, you know, I think people have a hard time I thinking about how they might completely abandon a car. Like if I even think about sort of the ways in which I sort of moved away from cars being in my life, it's that, you know, I could access car share pretty easily. Like I could access Zipcar or car to go or any of those, you know, so if I had to go out of town, I could, you know, find a thing or if I needed to go to Target or whatever and get a bulky thing, um, I could get that or having access to something like a bike share or even something like, you know, TNCs, taxis, various things like that. You know, how are we thinking about fleet electrification there? I think kind of thinking about, what people's patterns are so we can help chip away at it because sometimes the decision to go fully car free can be very overwhelming. But if you can think about, okay, well I can ax that. And if I had access to that, maybe that's, you know, maybe right. that's, you know, so I think we're hoping to dig into that a little bit too. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's a lot here that we can do and, and really focusing some core folks on transportation, I think could get us, um, to where we need to be, um, but thank you very much. I really, I really appreciate that. And I just look forward to, you know, all of our, our options and implementing them. Thank you. Questions, comments? Council Member Woods. Uh, thanks, it's a lot that we're doing. I think it's um, perfect for the city of Palm Springs to be take the lead on, on, on much of this. I think it shows um, um, our wherewithal to want to be concerned about the environment and the health of not only us, but the generations to come. Um, on, and, and just to pick up on the Mayor Pro Tem's comments, under, uh, on page 15 under bullet point two, um, uh, implementation airport shuttles encourage a low emitting mass transit options for events and revisit the trolley concept, mm -hmm. the buzz trolley. I think the buzz trolley, because it was fixed route, uh, did not prove itself to be very mm -hmm. cost effective but there are brand new firms out there that are doing something completely different, uh, such as Circuit mm -hmm. or Freebie or any of those that actually will shuttle people around from point A to point B. And I really think that's probably something to really investigate and look at for our city. I think the city of Palm Desert is um, going into contract with Circuit. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to make any context for you to make that happen. But I think that is a much better program um, to do, and they use electric vehicles they in the process of doing that. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Yeah, totally. I worked very extensively with Circuit in my last role, so I know them all. Okay. Council Member Holstich. Thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent report and presentation. Really appreciate it. And to the Sustainability Commission and all the people who've worked on this, um, really appreciate and the, all the work that we've done and our leadership on this issue. Um, and there are many things we 
um, did that aren't even included in here. Um, like I just visited our pollinator garden that we did with the turf conversion at the airport, and there were bees and all kinds of pollinators there. I mean, it was really cool to see it in action. So um, inspired by our work, um, I agree. I actually just um, sent um, the city manager the information about circuit too, because I think we do um, continue to have a first mile, last mile problem in the city of Palm Springs. Actually at Pride, um, we had a golf cart and we were like begged by some lady to give her a ride to her <laughs> sure, yeah. um, parking lot because she couldn't make it um, right. because we do have such a big long downtown Palm Canyon, Indian right. Canyon. It's really difficult for people to get around. And I've always said it's an accessibility and disability issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one, I like your um, focus on the data. I really very much want to see us do the most impactful work um, to both address climate um, and then also move into more climate resiliency work because we know that it's going to be almost uninhabitable here in our region. Um, and we really need to do work, um, not just in your department, but throughout the city. And that's why the city council um, picks sustainability as a um, priority going through all departments so that we are planning um, for heat and shade. And we are um, you know, doing that work with heat safety for our residents. I know um, someone told me that their landlord wasn't providing air conditioning and it was 100 degrees in their children's room every single day during the summer, right? Those are the problems that we're going to see more and more. And though we updated our building code to require uh, air conditioning to uh, by landlords for a unit to be habitable, I'm not sure if we've done uh, any enforcement on that or education. So, um, Sorry, it's late. Um, we've been going at this for a long time, but I just say that to say, like, thinking through, like, what else can we do and how do we move into the next phase of um, planning for a climate here that is less um, habitable um, and has more heat effects. Um, and your focus on data, I think, will be very, very helpful because, yeah, we could enforce forever and not actually take a bite out of the apple or whatever the phrase would be, right? Um, so making sure that we're, sp we're spending our time doing the most impactful work based on that data. And I agree with Mayor Pro Tem, Garner. Um, I think a lot of that will be around transportation. Um, so I'm excited to see that work. Um, and yeah, I would love to see how we can really integrate the sustainability work throughout all of the departments so that we harness the power of all city employees um, or staff members to, to work on these problems and solutions. So thank you so much for your leadership. Well, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues and thank you, thank the Sustainability Commission, but most importantly, uh, I want to thank the people of Palm Springs who have absolutely demonstrated uh, our commitment to uh, doing everything that we can uh, to make an impact. Uh, there is no larger impact that we have made uh, than uh, the Desert Community Energy Program, and we have Mr. Friedman here who is the director of that program. Uh, but uh, over 70% of our residents and businesses are enrolled in the 100% uh, carbon-free product. They're paying 8 to 10% more for electricity in order to be able to do that. There is no bigger testimony of the willingness of the overwhelming majority of our residents to do uh, what is necessary than the fact that they have put their pocketbook uh, out there. Uh, and we need to be continuing to reward and thank uh, our residents. I think uh, beyond that, when we look at some of the uh, numbers on EV charging stations, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but uh, we're very close to the city of Riverside in terms of number of charging stations. And uh, they're about six, seven times larger than we are in population. So um, one of the reasons that that's happening is not only are we putting in charging stations, our residents are buying electric cars. So in terms of data, one of the things I would like to see us start collecting 
is uh, not only how many charging stations do we have, but to the fullest extent we can, how many electric vehicles do we have in our uh, city and get that information out there and known and challenge our good friends in some of the other cities to uh, match us. So that, that data is actually somewhat available. So I was able to pull a couple of stats like right before the meeting, um, which I thought were very interesting and which I think will kind of be in line with the fact you shared about Riverside. So um, in the year 20, so the California DMV aggregates this data. Um, in the year 2021, um, we had 882 registered battery electric vehicles and 481 registered uh, plug-in hybrids, um, which is actually um, only five less in each category than the city of Sacramento, which is 11 times larger. Um, so really it's, you know, we still, we still have a ways to go in terms of hitting, you know, 30% as an EV registration target, I think is an, a near term target. That's a good one to set, but, um, it, we are pretty neck and neck with Palm desert, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, but, um, so we, we, we don't necessarily have the Valley bagging rights there, but, um, it is pretty impressive, especially compared to some of these larger cities. But yeah, I agree that kind of aggregating and, and sharing that would be great. It is impressive, and I would be more than happy to uh, have a battle with Palm Desert <laughs> over who can uh, buy and build uh, the most uh, stations. Both cities will win uh, at that. Uh, I would also like to see us tracking how many uh, homes we have with rooftop solar. Uh, it is absolutely an essential thing for us to do. Uh, the numbers that I've heard is Honolulu has uh, per capita more rooftop solar than any other city. Let's catch up. Uh, and what incentives and programs do we need to make sure that rooftop solar is not simply a luxury item for those uh, of means, but something that uh, is affordable and available uh, to everyone. We know it makes a difference. Uh, we have an incredibly unique uh, climate here uh, in terms of the amount of sun. Uh, we should be making it much easier uh, through our zoning and approval processes for anyone who wants to be uh, developing solar farms in Palm Springs. We've got some land that, uh, and when it comes to wind, those windmills are a beautiful sight and what whatever it takes to be able to help the conversion process of some of our older windmills to uh, the newer and much more efficient windmills is something we should work with our entrepreneurs to make sure we do. I'd also like us to be tracking how much uh, power is being produced uh, in Palm Springs that is being sold and distributed as elsewhere, which is fine that it's getting into the uh, to the net, but le let's know how much we are producing here. Recently, uh, we had a battery uh, storage project uh, that uh, began up at the north end of town. Uh, the firm that's building that uh, was actually a firm that. I heard about uh, in a report uh, that was presented at the CalPERS Board of Administration meeting uh, last month. It is the firm that has been identified nationally by CalPERS as being the most advanced moving forward in trying to address climate change, climate change targets. Uh, we need more of uh, next era and more battery storage and we need to make it abundantly easy for individuals who want to, uh, to take and build. Right now today, 38% of the electricity produced in this country comes from natural gas, and still 22% comes from coal. We are producing more electricity in this country from coal than we are producing from renewables. That is only going to change when we increase the capacity of renewable energy to be uh, built. We cannot save our way to uh, climate change. We can only do so to the extent that we radically increase the amount of renewable energy sources that we have. It is an illusion to believe that uh, we can just tell people don't use 
uh, fossil fuel and replace it with something and replace it with nothing. We have to replace it with renewable sources and there's no better place than Palm Springs to be building some of those renewable sources. So thank you for thank everything you. you're doing. We'll keep up. Oh, last thing before I forget. Uh, mobility issues, everybody knows traffic safety is a huge issue uh, for me. Uh, the United States is unique among Western uh, countries in that our vehicle accidents have not uh, declined in the last decade. Most European countries, the number of accidents have declined and one of the most critical reasons why uh, it is being identified that their rates are declining is they are building separate roadways for bicycles so that people feel safe and comfortable to get on the bikes and to go. If we want to be serious about mobility, we have got to dedicate roadways that are exclusively used for bicycles and for uh, pedestrians and that cars no longer can go on. Uh, and that is a significant change for us, but it's something, if we wanna see people on bikes, we gotta make it safe for them, and it's not today. Thank you. Right. Are there any other comments? All right. Okay. Thank you I'll all so much. Thank you so it. much. All right, our next item is, uh, I, I'm sorry? Uh, it is that time. Do we have any non-agenda public comment? Yes, Mayor, we have one. All right. We have um, Michael Pitkin. Michael Joseph Pitkin, mobbing is where two or more people conspire together to bully another person. Gaslighting, harassment, stalking, CSS computer syncing, and threats of blackmail no one would appreciate. Acts that are accepted and enacted by many that are degrading, targeted, calculated, and purposefully malicious should not be tolerated. Multiple people, Veterans, elderly, ex-prisoners, black individuals, and people of color have come up and said to my face, I do not deserve HIV care because they know people who are medically worse off and in more medical need than I am. I have also been told by these same individuals they harass me because they know it pisses me off. The following are my pet peeves. I will defend myself when women accuse men of abuse just because it's fashionable. The reality is many women are bullies and abuse men as well. I will defend myself when adults use children for entrapment. Over the years, sometimes weekly, I have had children wandering around and nearby me alone while adults are in their cars half a block away with phones and recording devices. I will defend myself against those using elderly, requiring them to cripple by me to show comparison with their wheelchairs, walkers, respiratory devices, canes, and other assist devices, just to prove they are more worthy of assistance than I am. I will defend myself when individuals come up to me purposely to act and use profanity and disgusting language just to force a reaction. This is called gang stalking. Gang stalking is threatening and abusive. No one would appreciate disgusting language being intentionally used against them. I'm only human and I am under duress and stress. Anyone will be defensive in response when purposefully and systematically threatened by people in positions of authority. All of these uncaring acts I deal with on a daily basis for years. Reverse discrimination is un-American. Next speaker is Rick Pantelli. I don't know 
his last name. Do you have to say, what's your last name? Stephen Viatic. Viet. Okay. Good evening, uh, City Council, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, staff. Um, I'm before you tonight to ask for help. Um, I'm the owner of Reefer Madness in Palm Springs. Um, my business has been issued an administrative fine concerning security measures of our storage area. Um, I just want to let you know I, I take security seriously. I take all the security measures seriously. Uh, we've always followed all the rules the right way all the time. Um, and I believe this uh, fine has been issued in error. Um, I prepared an extensive report on this. I dropped off seven copies uh, at the city clerk's office today uh, for city council as well as city manager. Um, I ask that uh, um, maybe you can re review this ahead of the uh, administrative appeals board meeting, which is uh, scheduled for Wednesday. Um, and I'm asking for your help. Uh, my report shows that I'm not in violation uh, why I'm not in violation and why I've never been in violation. And I'm requesting that the council study this uh, and take action or pull this up uh, if, if possible. Um, thank you for your time. Are you speaking, Mr. Rick Pantelli? You have two minutes. Thank you. Hello, Council. Nice seeing you. I haven't been here in a couple of years. If I'm out tonight wearing my dad's lucky blazer, it's important. For those who are, you, of you who are unfamiliar with me, I was in the conference room 20 years ago with the former police chief and council as we started to make what was the first cannabis laws in the state of California. Very proud of that. And that's the reason I'm here. My, my concerns are real that Palm Springs maintains these high standards. Stephen at Reefer Madness has been operating for about three years. He employs 18 people and he serves approximately 200 customers a day. I spoke on Stephen's behalf when he first applied for his license because I knew that he had solid character. He, was revi he has revitalized the mall that he is located at and has always paid his taxes on time. I can personally vouch for Stephen that he has an abundance of integrity and operates 100% compliant 100% of the time. That is why I'm here tonight to ask you to put a pause on the appeals hearing due this Wednesday and allow time for his report to be submitted to be reviewed to determine if in fact the citation was issued in error. Although it is a bit unprecedented, it is not impractical to request this pause to review the facts and evidence he has presented because the ramifications for him are catastrophic. It isn't about the money for him, but rather the negative mark on his record with the Department of Cannabis Control, which is permanent. I feel he deserves the time he's requesting for his report to be reviewed, a determination to be made which allow for a withdrawal of the citation. I understand how busy you people are with vacation rentals and all the things you're doing, but for Stephen, this is his entire life savings that he has come to Palm Springs to build his business, and I ask for you to help him. You are his last hope. And for that, I thank you. And it's a refreshing thing to come to a council meeting and see our police department sitting up here and not over there on the little plastic table. And very happy to see our new police chief here. OK, thank you, folks. No further commenters. Thank you. And we will move on to uh, our last item, which is uh, agenda item 3C. And before we begin on that, uh, I've had a request uh, that we uh, not take final action on this, but just simply uh, have an opportunity for each one of us to weigh in with our uh, comments. Uh, and then I've also had a request that we, we do proceed. So I want to check in with uh, my colleagues as to whether or not we want to uh, uh, engage a full discussion. Uh, with action this evening. Councilmember Kors. Um, well, I think we should engage the discussion and then based on that discussion, if someone wants us not to proceed for some reason, we can discuss it. But we may, you know, we don't know what people's views are. People may okay. not think we should do anything ever. So, you know, given you don't have to adopt an ordinance at all on this issue under the state rules. So I think we should have the discussion and then decide if that makes sense what we want to do or not do today. Because there is, are a lot of changes, we wouldn't be able to do anything anyway. That is I how we generally proceed it. Yeah. Is everyone comfortable with that? All right, then uh, staff report, please. 
Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council, we have put together an ordinance for you relative to sidewalk vending. The basis for the ordinance is Senate Bill 946, which establishes the parameters for local regulations. Uh, the basic tenets of the ordinance is that it allows for both stationary sidewalk vendors and roaming sidewalk vendors on public sidewalks. One of the things I want to point out is that this does not cover vending on private property. Uh, that is covered under the city's zoning ordinance. There are already procedures in place uh, which deal with that. And so the discussion this evening is solely focused on vending that occurs and is allowed to occur under state law on public sidewalks. Let me first go through locational requirements. I'll go through the various aspects of what we're proposing under this ordinance, starting first where sidewalk vendors may locate. So stationary vendors, meaning vendors that set up a display or a stand, are allowed in all commercial zones. Roaming sidewalk vendors are allowed in commercial zones and residential zones. The roaming vendors, as their name implies, are vendors that are typically on foot or have a cart uh, and would be proceeding down public sidewalks, but do not uh, stay in one place. In terms of requirements for stationary vendors, what we're proposing is that they must maintain at least six feet of pedestrian passage. Uh, the reason that we uh, propose that in the ordinance is we're particularly concerned about our pedestrian areas. Six feet is the standard that we require for sidewalk dining, um, also for uh, the freestanding signs that we allow in our downtown area. Um, one of the things I might suggest is uh, in other areas other than the downtown, we may not have that much room on the sidewalks. We may not have a full six foot sidewalk. And so what we might look at is outside of the downtown and uptown areas, for example, uh, a lesser standard uh, that still maintains ADA accessibility on the sidewalk, but wouldn't necessarily need to be six feet. In addition, we're prohibiting vendors within 10 feet of fire hydrants uh, for safety access, obviously, within 10 feet of bus stops, handicapped parking spaces, and police and fire driveways. Uh, and so, again, looking at safety issues and keeping them back from those particular areas. In addition, we're prohibiting sidewalk vendors within corner visibility zones. Uh, this is, again, based on the needs for traffic and for visibility uh, at intersections and protecting public safety. Uh, we also would not allow them in public parking spaces, uh, in driveways, or blocking building entrances or windows. Uh, and so those are the proposed locational requirements. In terms of the type of cart or furniture uh, and utilities that they would be permitted to have, uh, per state law, there's a list of different type of um, display uh, uh, things that the stationary vendor may have, such as a cart, a rack, stand, display, and we list that in the definition in the ordinance. However, we would prohibit stationary vendors from having tables, chairs, shade structures, freestanding signs, or other site furniture, keeping in mind that they are in a public sidewalk area. In addition, they wouldn't be allowed to store their merchandise in the sidewalk area. Uh, that would need to be stored in a vehicle, um, but it could not be stored on the sidewalk other than in their immediate display that they may have. And then finally, we wouldn't permit electrical cords, uh, gas lines if they have cooking facilities or water lines. The reason for that is, again, looking at public safety we don't want to create trip hazards on the public sidewalk. Uh, and so for those reasons, we are proposing those restrictions. For those that may be preparing or selling food products, uh, they would need to have a mobile food facility permit and a food handler's card from Riverside County. However, if they're selling packaged food, they would not need that. 
We're also proposing that no open flame or charcoal fuel be permitted. Again, this is based on safety, that they're within a constrained public right of way. And so we do have concerns about open flames. Uh, however, uh, they would be allowed to have self-contained carts with warming trays uh, or other uh, similar methods to keep food warm. So much like you see the carts in New York City, the hot dog carts, uh, those would be permitted in the sidewalk area. Uh, in addition, uh, those that are dispensing food or preparing food would not be allowed to discharge water, grease, or oil onto the sidewalk or the street. Uh, this is both for safety reasons and then also for protection of wastewater. The cities may establish hours of operation. What we are proposing is in residential zones to limit that between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, and then in commercial zones from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, you do not necessarily need to have restrictions on hours or you may propose more generous hours. And so you would take direction from the city council in terms of what you feel would be appropriate. There is provisions in state law relative to vending in public parks. It does allow cities to regulate to the extent where it may impact the recreation or scenic beauty of the park. And so what we're proposing is that vending would not be permitted in public parks less than two acres in size. Uh, that currently includes two parks. Uh, we have the downtown park, which is less than two acres. And then we also have the gateway park at the intersection of Vista Chino and Gene Autry, which is less than two acres in size. However, sidewalk vendors would be allowed to establish or set up on the sidewalks adjacent to those parks. They just would not be allowed within the park itself. Any park greater than two acres in size, they would be allowed to set up in the park. Uh, we are not proposing any additional restrictions in those parks. There is one caveat to that. Wherever we have an exclusive concessionaire agreement for the park, uh, they would not be permitted within that park area. In terms of the permit process, we would require a city business license. Uh, they would also be required to obtain a seller's permit from the Department of Tax and Fee Administration. There's a number of optional considerations that we do have in the staff report. These are generally recommended as things to protect the city as these activities will be allowed in the public rights of way. Uh, the first of those is require an encroachment permit. Uh, I identify in the staff report in terms of the cost of that. There also is an additional time frame above and beyond the issuance of a business license. Uh, that would make that a little bit problematic for some of our sidewalk vendors. Another thing that is suggested is to have them carry general liability insurance with the city named as an additional insured. Again, this is looking at the fact that they are established in public rights of way. Uh, there are issues that may occur, and so this would offer some additional protection to the city. And then finally, what we have seen from other cities, some are requiring a live scan report. This adds to the cost and also to the time frame required uh, in terms of getting that report back. So these are optional considerations. Your city attorney uh, would certainly encourage the general liability insurance at a minimum, uh, but we will take direction from city council in terms of whether or not you want to require those items. One of the other things that you had asked us to look at is our food truck regulations. And while I don't have any proposal before you this evening for modifications to our existing food truck ordinance, I did offer this table in the staff report, which compares the proposed mobile food, uh, this, excuse me, the sidewalk vending ordinance with our food truck ordinance as it currently exists. And so this is intended as a point of discussion. If you want to give us direction this evening in terms of what you would like us to see uh, to modify in the food truck ordinance, we'd be more than happy to take your input. 
So that is my brief overview of the sidewalk vending ordinance and what we are proposing. I also have Mr. Albert Maldonado from Best Best and Krieger, uh, who was our attorney on this issue, who would be available to answer questions you might have about what is permissible under state law and the ordinance itself. With that, Mr. Maldonado and I are available to take your questions. Are there questions for staff? If I go ahead, Council Member Holstage. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work on this. So, can you just detail <clears throat> sort of where some of the regulations, new regulations, came for for sidewalk vendors? I know I had originally asked about food trucks because. And the council agreed, majority of council agreed to consider um, how food, our mobile food vending vehicle um, ordinance is sort of unfair and unreasonable and almost absurd, absurd now when you compare it to the state law on sidewalk vending. And so now what's in front of us um, is um, morphed into a very complex system of regulation for sidewalk vending. So could you just explain um, where because my understanding is that SB 972 uh, sets a lot of these frameworks, and so I know that we can um, set our own in certain areas, which you've described in the staff report is truly excellent um, in explaining those differences. But can you just walk us through why we're here now considering detailed regulations for food for food, sidewalk vendors? So in addition to asking us to look at uh, mobile food trucks, uh, we also received direction from council to look at sidewalk vending. Um, as you've been aware, we have had comments from the public in terms of concerns. Um, there have been issues where vending is setting up uh, adjacent to residential areas, for example, um, that has caused a number of public concerns. And so for that reason, we've brought forth uh, a draft ordinance with the intent of taking direction from city council, because we haven't discussed this in detail in terms of what you would like to see in a sidewalk vending ordinance, we worked from a model ordinance and from what other communities have adopted uh, with the intent that you would provide direction and allow us to tailor it uh, to what you feel would be more specific to our community. Thank you, that's helpful um, and I, so I know sometimes we say to look at something, but we don't give really clear direction about what it is we wanted to see with sidewalk vending. So um, I think that's helpful um, to, to, I think that what you've brought forward is good. I'm um, just hearing from public comment that, you know, there um, might be further involvement we'd like to do with um, vendors themselves. There might be some barriers included in here that we didn't intend um, that might not be consistent with the intent, at least, of state law. Um, so those are going to be my questions, but I'll, I'll hear from the rest of the council and then add on. Other questions for uh, Flynn or Mr. Maldonado? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. My question is, you know, you have Senate Bill 946 that's listed here in our staff report, but starting January 1, there's a update, which is 972. So I'm curious why there's only the citation of 946 and not the updated version. Certainly. And if Mr. Maldonado could join us, perhaps he can address those questions. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Um, Mayor Pertem, I can answer your question directly. Um, when SB 946 was adopted in 2018, there was one, I'll describe it as a loophole, that gave cities the authority to criminally enforce as to food sidewalk vendors. And that is that the state legislation didn't touch the California Retail Food Code. California Retail Food Code is state law that empowers each of the counties in California to adopt regulations for uh, food preparation and handling and impose criminal penalties as well. And what several cities have done, but Palm Springs has not, is adopt by reference 
the county's environmental health code as its own, and then designate either itself, the city, the county, or both to enforce that now city's environmental health code. What SB 972 did is beginning January 1, it closed that loophole. So now there is no criminal enforcement whatsoever for food sidewalk vendors. But the reason that it is not included in the ordinance before you is because Palm Springs is a city that never adopted by reference the county's environmental health code. So even under SB 946, um, before SB 972 is to take effect, it, it could not impose criminal penalties upon food sidewalk vendors because it didn't have the proper code from the county adopted. And so SB 972 regulates food sidewalk vendors and establishes a, a regime of regulations for counties to regulate them. But the, the city of Palm Springs will not uh, regulate the um, approval of the food card or giving of the food handlers card. All of that is gonna be handled by the county. All the city will be doing is, is pointing to the county, pointing the vendors to the county, that is, and saying, whatever the county is gonna require, you have to show us that you have done it before we're gonna give you our uh, city business license. Council, uh, I'm seeing hands all. Okay, council member course. Um, and welcome. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, when we're talking about um, blocking building entrances or windows, you're only talking about stationary, not someone who's just doing a transaction who's roaming? That's correct, only the stationary vendors. Okay. Um, when it says that tables, chairs, shade structure, freestanding signs, or other site furniture are not permitted, um, if someone's selling with a table and sitting at their own chair, is that not permitted? Or are you talking about people setting up tables and chairs to make it a place for people to stop and eat? The vendor's own table and chair would be permissible. However, setting up uh, tables and chairs for customers would not be permissible. Okay. And for shade structures, are you talking about a shade structure for the vendor? Uh, correct. Okay. So why would... What is the reasoning of not allowing that given the sun and heat in Palm Springs? What we might want to do is allow the vendor to have an umbrella. What we don't want them to do is to set up a tent or other types of structures on the sidewalk itself. Uh, so having a cart with an umbrella, for example, an attached okay. umbrella seems, would yeah, be appropriate. We want to make sure they have shade, I would yeah. think. Um, freestanding signs, can we touch on that? Because that's how a lot of people are going to see I mean, we allow them on Palm Canyon for every business who wants them. Um, I'm just sort of curious why we wouldn't allow them at all here. The intent would, to, would be to have the signage on the display or the rack itself. Uh, again, they are setting up in the sidewalk. We would want to minimize to the degree possible uh, the amount of obstructions or, or things that people could trip okay. and fall over. Um, however, as you mentioned, we do allow A-frame signs, uh, and so if that's something that you would like to allow as part of this ordinance, we can certainly make adjustments. But even, and that's definitely something we should talk about, but even the way it's written, they'd be allowed to have a sign on the front of their table. Let's say they're using a table, not a cart, which in the presentation seemed to be they had to use a cart. But if they can use a table, right, so it's cost effective for them, they could have a sign in the front and on the side attached to the table currently? Correct, they could. Okay. okay. Um, as far as ven the hours, um, and I realize we, there's, there is leeway in what the state allows, right? Um, there's also their goals, so um, and we should talk about both of those. But for commercial zones, my reading of the state law was that it has to be the similar as other businesses on the street. So if we ban it at 9 p.m. when restaurants or staying open some till one or two in the morning, how does that work? So in looking at that, we don't necessarily have to impose hours. Right. 
No, I'm just saying why. Yeah, we are is, allowed to do so. Do you see 9 p.m. is legal on a street that has restaurants open serving food till 2 in the morning? Under yes. State law? When we look at vending, considering that we have sidewalk vendors who vend retail merchandise versus sidewalk vendors that vend food products, as you look at our retail businesses, most of them close at 9 p.m. or earlier. Uh, and so that's where we started as a starting point. Um, if the council would like to extend that, that's certainly something that you can look at. Uh, if you want to remove that in commercial zones as well, that's certainly okay. something that you could look at. Yeah. And my concern here was on the legal issue, because my, my reading of the ordinance, which I haven't read again today, but I've read recently, um, the state ordinance was it had to be similar to similar types of businesses on the same street. So it seems that we, we'd have to sort of base it on where they're located if it's stationary, right? Because retail may close right at eight o'clock on most of Palm Canyon, but another road, they may be open later, right? Restaurants, et cetera. So I just, can we do that? I guess it's a lawyer question. Can we do, can we just pick a time under state law given what the state law says? The, it's, less, it's not meant to be a comment so as a question. So on what I prefer, just I'm trying to understand that what's allowed and what isn't. Mr. Maldonado, do you want to go ahead and respond to that? The answer is, is yes, that you can, council member. Um, like businesses on the same street or in the same area, you know, slash district. Um, for food vendors, is you mentioned a restaurant. A food sidewalk vendor in a commercial area should be allowed to vend uh, during the same hours as a restaurant. Those are like businesses. If they were on the same street, my legal opinion would be that the city should allow that. Okay. Uh, great. And yeah, I think the rest of mine issues on odor, smoke, lighting, noise, et cetera, are all more comments. So I will hold those until questions are done. Other questions? I do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what a live scan report is. So a live scan report is something that we require for a, a number of other business types, uh, most notably our cannabis businesses. Uh, what it does essentially is it provides the, um, uh, the background on the individual in terms of any convictions they may have. Some cities adopt this as a protective measure uh, especially as you look at vendors who may be selling to minors or things like that. Um, and so that's what a live scan report is. Thank you. Uh, other question I have has to do with uh, business licenses. So if we adopt uh, recommendations that uh, uh, these uh, street vendors obtain a business license, who would be obtaining the business license? The owner of the uh, uh, street vending uh, equipment and product or the person who's actually operating it? So what we have indicated in the ordinance is that the business owner would obtain the business license. Right. So we've received reports that frequently it is uh, a independent owner uh, that is employing and at wages that are not uh, very clear uh, and the street vendors are working for that, that firm. Uh, would we have the ability to require that the business license be posted on any uh, street vending uh, site so that uh, customers would be able to see whether or not they're buying product from uh, the individual that they're interacting with or they're buying product that actually is owned uh, by uh, a much larger entity? I believe it would be appropriate to have them have a copy of the business license available for inspection by the public. Okay. Uh, we do require that of other businesses, and so I think that would Thank be you. a similar uh, standard that we could uphold. Those are my questions. I as well have comments. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, would we uh, 
Council Member Woods. Um, if I'm understanding how the ordinance is writ writ written, that you cannot cook, have gas, have fire, have anything like that. So basically, they're selling fruit or vegetables? No, they could serve other food products. As an example, I mentioned the hot dog carts that you have in New York City. Uh, what they have typically is self-contained LP gas in the cart itself, which then heats warming trays. And so there is the ability to do that. It doesn't produce an open flame that's exposed to the public. What we're trying to avoid is, as I mentioned, some of the, um, the issues in terms of having a barbecue on the sidewalk, for example, or having some type of a propane burner that is open and exposed. Those are the type of issues that we want to avoid based on potential hazards to the general public. But something that is self-contained in a cart where there isn't an open flame that's exposed uh, would be appropriate. And so uh, prepared food in that manner would be, uh, would be permissible under the ordinance as proposed. And the other question I have um, is um, if somebody has a food truck and they park it in the right of way, uh, is that prohibited? So food trucks are governed by our mobile food truck ordinance. There uh, are some locational restrictions in terms of where they may park on public streets, uh, but they are allowed to vend in the public rights of way. Okay, so just so I'm clear, Flynn, thank you, is a food truck can basically pull up on the street or do they need to be on the off the sidewalk and in the median area? No, they can be on the public street. Down the street and then serving on the sidewalk as long as you keep a free and clear of, I think 10 feet, was it? That you're uh, no, oh, uh, the, I don't believe that we have the language in terms of free and clear sidewalk in the mobile food truck ordinance. Okay. They have to vend on the sidewalk side. They can't vend to the street side, obviously. Okay, so we have a popular, I just wanna make sure that I'm really clear. <laughs> we have a very popular person at the corner of um, uh, Indian Canyon and Racket Club, and they set up a mobile food truck nightly, um, lights, open flame, the whole works. It is on private property. Um, it serves a lot of people when the restaurants are closed, um, it, and there's always a line there. Is that allowed? So a food truck may uh, park on private property, number one, if they have permission of the property owner, and number two, if they have a land use permit. So that is something that is permitted under our code currently. Uh, I don't know that that individual does. I do know they leave a lot of trash behind every day in a lot of free <laughs> spots. Okay, I just wanna be clear between somebody pulling up a, a, a mobile food truck versus a cart, okay, between the two. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Halstitch. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and I think that's why this needed clarification is because there is a lot of blurring of the lines between what is a food truck, what is a mobile food street vendor. You know, we have some merging of the two, like that one, um, which I think is a popular taco spot, um, and they. Um, it's, it's kind of both, where it um, really started as a mobile food vendor. Um, so that's what's confusing to me, and, you know, and even reading our ordinance and why I believe our food truck ordinance is now absurd um, is that that allowed on pri that food trucks require an LUP, a land use permit. And it sounded like Here's the thing. What we did when we considered food trucks a while ago is that they were seen as a threat to restaurants and they were an ordinance was written by the city council that essentially did not allow food trucks in most areas of the city is my understanding of the history of this talking to city council members and the former city manager, people who are here at the time. Um, and if you read the ordinance, 
you see that, you know, that it's not allowed within 500 feet of public parks, um, food trucks are not, that they're not allowed within 500 feet of schools, um, that you need a land use permit to um, have one on your own private property. Um, I mean, it's the hours, they can only operate from nine to five. <laughs> um, I mean, frankly, this ordinance, in my opinion, is ridiculous. I'm sorry, it's almost 1030 at night and I'm very exhausted. So it's ridiculous. And I'm concerned that we're, and I, I agree that there are certain issues to regulate with um, sidewalk vending, but I'm concerned that, again, we're taking this thing that is um, exciting and supports our community and allows business opportunities when restaurants are closed, like in late later hours. It allows a whole another portion of our economy to thrive, and that's what food trucks are. And I hope that our, I see how the Palm Springs Hospital Hospitality Association and those tourism industries can understand that these are other slices of the pie of the market that we're not currently hitting because so many of our restaurants are closed on Sunday evenings and my family, you know, can't go find where to eat on Sunday evenings and that's why people are going to these taco trucks um, or uh, mobile vendors. So I hope that we're not seeing it as just a negative to enforce and restrict and shut down like we did with food trucks and that that's what my problem is with this ordinance, um, that it doesn't, that it's overly restrictive and it doesn't doesn't allow, uh, and, and I think that in some ways, um, though I think staff did an excellent job, I think it um, counteracts the intent in state law to allow for this industry to not burden it with live scan and you know criminal background checks that aren't required in the restaurant industry at large, you know, things that don't, aren't um, applicable generally. Um, so I understand, and I'm guilty of this because I called our city manager and said, why is there a... Um, boost mobile or some like a cell phone pop-up that's happening on the street corners, right? And it seems predatory and is this a real business? So I understand that we need to do some regulation, but I think this is just much too, too much regulation and we haven't engaged street vendors is my understanding. And so we have some really good um, expertise. Juan Espinosa called in. I followed his work with the state law as an equal justice fellow. Um, he's an expert on this, and I think that we just have a lot more conversations um, in the community to be had before we would um, consider an ordinance. But um, I will ask the restaurant industry to understand and to consider how um, a rising tide lifts all boats, um, and more business is better for all of us, and we don't have to just shut it down because um, it's seen as a threat. Other comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm also concerned about the, the same issue that it's becoming overly restrictive and essentially doesn't allow for a lot of the, the vendors that we're actually seeing in the city and that have been bringing much needed um, business to Palm Springs and I think overwhelmingly people are excited about them. Um, but I, you know, I have seen issues in terms of blocking the sidewalk too much to prevent people from going past and things like that. We need to address those, but I don't think that we need to necessarily create our own ordinance to do that. A lot of the things that need to be addressed are already, already exist in, in the state law. And so then just making sure that our code enforcement has an understanding of what the state law says to make sure that we aren't violating any public, public access right of ways is really, in my opinion, all we need. And in terms of the food trucks, it is really just essentially getting rid of the ordinance and allowing it to, again, go under state law and be one and the same. Um, I, I'm just not interested in completely getting rid of, I, I don't want to get rid of these businesses, and I want to make sure that we're actually supporting local people and not um, just shutting it down when really we could say, hey, you're not in compliance with our noise ordinance, you need to be in compliance with our noise ordinance instead of just saying you can't operate anymore. There's already things that exist that people can com comply with that would make this better for everyone instead of 
putting unnecessary measures on them. Uh, Council Member Kors. Uh, great. Um, thank you. Uh, I do agree that I think we want our food truck and sidewalk vending to be similar because they are similar. Um, and, um, you know, I think state law was designed to give people an opportunity, including people who um, can't get jobs because they have recent criminal convictions. I mean, that's right in their ordinance. So the live scan seems really very counter to the state law's goals. Um, and to provide opportunities for low-income people and immigrants um, to work, right, and make a living. Um, where I think we, and I don't know if we need to do it in this ordinance or how, I think there are issues, right, because I've gone by some. There are a decent number in District 3, both in residential neighborhoods, but also, you know, um, in commercial neighborhoods where you have odor and smoke going into with the ones with open flames, I've had complaints from residents on one, and I've had complaints from businesses, which really impacts, right, their business, right? I appreciate, you know, why we'll just use restaurants, for example, feel it's unfair. But the state made these rules, right? So they decided they're going to allow this. And a restaurant could choose to do it as well, right? They could just set up, right, tables and sell as well without paying rent. But they can't have people sitting there, and that's, that is a difference. But I do think dealing with smoke, right, dealing, I mean, you've seen some of the strung up lighting poles that can't imagine are allowed in our city already, to the Mayor Pro Tem's point. Um, but, you know, I think we want to look at the health and safety issues. Um, I think those are a real concern. Um, and uh, so those are the ones that, you know, seem to be the biggest impact. Um, the ones where the business is really having an impact, not just because they're competing, quote unquote, but because they're imp impacting the guests and the employees um, there. Also, you know, how we figure out we need to make sure we're doing ADA compliance as we are with any other, as we do with everything else. Um, and, you know, if we go smaller than the six feet, you're going to have the problems, which we've seen at some of these, where you have customers totally blocking passage, right? And someone in a wheelchair on a walker, you know, at night is, has a hard time. You know, yes, people can move, but I think we, we want to look at that. So I'm just trying to go through the issues I think we really mm -hmm. we want to address, and I feel the same way on food trucks. They, I think they should need to be similar. I think the state, the state has made what um, you might say was ridiculous into what's absurd. Um, but um, in this, the food truck ordinance is almost a decade old, I think. Um, and yes, you don't want them taking up lots of parking spaces on Palm Canyon, but the restrictions are so severe. I mean, we really did basically, the ordinance the city has just really prohibits them for the most part. Uh, and pre-COVID, we, we're getting close to getting some changes done. So um, so just as far as direction, uh, I think those are the areas. And, and maybe it's a question for the city attorney who's on is issues like the smoke, noise, safety, um, obviously complying with county right food handling rules, all, all those make sense to me. Um, do we need an ordinance for that or based on the way the state law is written? Um, or do, do we have enough already in our arsenal to just give direction for enforcement of current rules to get there? So I have not read the ordinances uh, governing the topics that you just mentioned, but I'm going to guess that among their penalties include criminal penalties. And under SB 946, none of those criminal penalties will be enforceable. It also would not be enforceable if you pass this ordinance. No criminal enforcement is allowed whatsoever anymore. So even if you have, you know, someone having lights and smoke and, and they're, they're really being, let's say, a pest, um, you cannot enforce criminally as to that vendor. The best that you could do um, is you give them an admin site, but if they ignore them, you continue giving them to them. But if they ignore all of them, the city can take that vendor to court, get a civil judgment, forcing them to pay. And by the way, you have to allow um, someone who has, someone who's, uh, let's say, low income, you have to allow them to pay whatever they can pay. Let's say our fine is $100. If they can only pay 50, then the law says we have to accept 50. But let's just say that they're not, they're not paying at all. And, and now we have that civil judgment. 
requiring them to pay the city for those fines. If they ignore that court order, then we can arrest them and enforce criminally. But everything up until that point, there is no criminal enforcement that we could do whatsoever, regardless of anything that you currently have on the books. So, right. So, but I guess my question is, do we, given that, do we need an ordinance versus, I guess we need to look at what our other ordinances do to address the health and safety concerns or the business license issue? Um, because regardless of if we do a new ordinance or enforce our current ordinances, um, we can't enforce criminally. Uh, so, correct. I, I, I think I think maybe the biggest thing would be vending uh, stationary vendors in residential areas. Uh, you probably don't have that anywhere on on your books now, um, and the state law allows you to prohibit allows you to not requires you to allows you to prohibit stationary vendors in residential areas. And also, when when you adopt an ordinance, that's an educational tool, and we're not going to be able to force compliance with criminal penalties, but at least it's an educational tool that you can take out to your community members and say, look, these are the, the regulations that we have adopted and that we want everyone to abide by. Mayor Pretend. Thank you. I just want to be clear. I don't want to restrict uh, vending in residential areas. We have so many fruit vendors that are set up in our residential area in neighborhoods and they've been wonderful and people stop by and get fruit from them and they've been doing this for years and they're, I don't, I think that we've been hearing some complaints about the tacos and things that have been sold, but we certainly have not heard anything about some of these others or flower vendors as well. So I, I, re I really don't want us to go down that route. Council member Kors. There's one coming to that. Yeah, I think a few complaints I've gotten on those um, have related to sort of how far, not how, that they're not back enough um, for some of them, and they could be, right? Um, and yeah, and trash, right? That, um, and I think there's ways we can help, right, work with them to, to address both of those. Um, because obviously leaving tr trash on the street isn't allowed anyway. So uh, yeah. I do think those are, yeah. those, those seem to be the ones, but I do know people who really like having them in their neighborhoods yeah. as well, so. So if I could, a, a few comments. Uh, and I, I think the motivation of the state legislature uh, was pretty clear. They were trying to uh, help uh, underprivileged individuals who uh, were struggling to have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to make an income and to supplement an income. Uh, and uh, that's a very laudable uh, goal. And the history of street vending, particularly in some neighborhoods, uh, is very long. And it has been largely immigrant uh, individuals who uh, are getting a, a foothold into entrepreneurship. And those are things that uh, I'm supportive of and, and want to continue. Um, but uh, someone setting up uh, an open flame in the middle of our downtown is an entirely uh, different matter. And uh, I think it is appropriate for us to have health and safety rules. Uh, I'm surprised to find that uh, we have not uh, adopted the County Environmental Food Code. I believe we definitely should be doing that. Uh, but I must tell you, uh, I am very concerned uh, that the explosion that we have seen in our city in the last year of uh, food vending is not coming from local folks who are uh, trying to get a foothold, uh, but are individuals that are working for someone else. And we don't know that yet. Uh, but given how quickly uh, this industry has exploded in our city, I find it 
I find myself struggling to believe that it was suddenly uh, organically grown from uh, local individuals and the stories that uh, these vendors are actually working for large corporate interests or large employers out of Los Angeles uh, is one that uh, uh, I'm concerned is, is true. Uh, so I think it's important we know who's, who owns these businesses, and it's important the public knows who, who in fact owns the business. And I don't have uh, a great amount of sympathy uh, for a organization a uh, hundred miles away uh, sending people into our community where there's not clarity as to what wages uh, they are being paid. Uh, if what we have done is create a new opportunity for immigrant labor to be exploited, I don't think that's something that uh, we want to do in our city or anywhere else. And I don't know what the facts are yet. I, and I want to understand what those facts are before we uh, start to proceed. Um, so with, with that, my concern is that we need more time to, to know exactly who it is that we're interacting with. But in the meantime, uh, what we can do from a health and safety standpoint is something I believe we should, uh, we should be doing. Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would um, echo what the mayor said. I, um, uh, I know in the city of Santa Monica, they've dealt with this exact same problem where there is um, almost a, a, a mafia style that operates those vendors. Uh, they may provide some insight into what we may need to do here, um, but I agree that there's a huge difference between a small ma and pa who wants to sell vegetables or fruit on the corner and somebody who's exploiting people for purpose. So I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do think having some time to investigate that um, so that we can assure, and also if somebody gets sick, you know, how do they know who to go to, um, you know, in that type of a setting? So I, I'm not sure quite how do we do that and um, what kind of process it would be. Thank you. Sure, and one of the things, right, the state bill allows is although we'd have to probably pass something to allow it, but um, getting the name and current mailing address of the vendor as well as if they're an agent or work for an individual company and that data. And so until we get that data, we won't know those answers. So um, I do th agree we want to get that data to have a better sense. Um, you know. Right, and, and I think, you know, maybe we can do some kind of, you know, community meeting that includes reaching out to the vendors, you know, it's probably hard for them to participate, but um, could be helpful as well as, you know, others uh, to get more input on that. Um, but I do agree, you know, we really, we want to address the health and safety issues and the ADA issues sooner rather than later. Well, okay. I we think we need other. to know. I have heard reports, and I, I just don't know whether they're valid or not, uh, that these poor folks are being charged by the individual taco, uh, individual tortilla that uh, is distributed and that there's a count uh, made of, of each one of them. Now, if that's true, that's exploitation. That is not, uh, and if it's not true, then we, we need to know. Council Member Holstich. Thank you. If I can just ask, um, and just to clarify my comments, um, I do agree health and safety. So what you said, odor, smoke, open flames, or any safety, public health or safety issues um, we should address. I'm interested in how it overlaps with SB 972 and the regulations there. And then I'm interested in learning more about the county health, um, environmental health rules. And it sounds like the county has a mobile food vending 
ordinance as well. So how those compare because, um, and I know a lot of organizations work closely with Riverside. I followed the city of Riverside's um, work on this and getting to an ordinance. So a lot, this, we don't have to recreate the wheel here. Um, so just to be clear, I do agree health and safety, ADA compliance. Um, I don't agree with um, sort of some of the limited hours that seem too restrictive, the live scan, um, an exorbitant fee and for an encroachment permit, which probably isn't exorbitant compared to how much it costs the city to implement, but might be exorbitant um, if you make $10,000 a year. Um, general liability insurance, live scan, I think those are uh, really too far and um, for what the state at least intended. Um, it, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, it sounds like we are talking about those two categories, and so I think staff got that right with roaming versus stationary, right? Because I agree, I'm concerned about um, not allowing them in residential because I think of the the um, vendors who are selling flowers or fruit and who are like useful um, community vendors and we want the, I want those in my neighborhood. Um, so versus some of the other things that we're hearing. Um, I will say, and just a plug for like economic opportunity and economic development work, when I had been trying, we had been working on a pilot program with the food truck um, with Indio's, what is the name? Indio, um, Eric Besserel did a pilot program in Indio and he got the Indio food truck um, park and the Coachella food truck park. And we had been working with him on a program to support local owners um, to actually get certified and get their public health certificates and be able to go, go into business. And I will say that model of economic development from the ground up, and we can invest city resources in that um, as opposed to like criminalization will work a lot better. So, um, I mean, we need to do this, we won't criminalize. Um, but yeah, I think investing some city funds there and doing that work of getting vendors involved in city processes will um, will help because those are the business owners of the future too, if they can you know, continue to grow. Um, the brick and mortar of the future, if they can continue to get investments. So um, yeah, just to echo, um, so I think that, so if you could answer really quickly for the county uh, mobile truck, mobile street vending ordinance, is there a reason we wouldn't just adopt the county's rules or um, their infrastructure for enforcement or do they not apply in the city of Palm Springs? No, they wouldn't apply in the city of Palm Springs, but we can look at them as an example. Just compare. Okay, thanks. All right. Any other comments? Councilmember Woods. I would agree um, what was just stated. Um, I would add one other thing, and I use an example. <clears throat> in the city of Miami, there is an overpass, an underpass, excuse me, with a sidewalk that goes through it and a bus that's under the underpass, a bus stop, I should say. And there is a vendor that uses a bleacher style um, display to display flowers. And they're there every day. And when you walk under that underpass and you, or you sit at that bus stop, you not only see this beautiful display of flowers, but you actually see, you actually smell them as you're sitting at the bus stop. But I think our ordinance, the way it's written, may not allow something like that. Um, and I think that's a shame. I think I would like to see, and maybe that's different than food, and we can separate the two or something. But I think that that would be an asset to the community versus a detriment to the community. So I'm happy to share some pictures, but it is not flowers in a bucket. It is really a display and it's a permanent thing that they go there every day. So just my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I think the thing that is the most um, obvious to me here is that we, we have not engaged with the community of folks who are actually selling um, food or flowers or other goods and I think that's really the most important part here is really engaging with those folks and and finding out um, how this benefits them um, or not and uh, but I do think that there are the 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 worker the folks who have been organizing 
regarding um, sidewalk vending have been doing a lot of really amazing work over the last several years. So we do have more people um, vending than ever before. And part of that is because of the organizing efforts of activists um, in making this, um, decriminalizing it and really allowing for people to take um, these opportunities. So I think that part of it is just that there's been a shift um, and people are taking advantage of that. And a lot of people have been ready to, to do this for a long time or used to do it in other areas of the Coachella Valley and are now um, feeling confident and able to do it here in Palm Springs, which is new for us um, and will take some getting used to for some. Uh, but I do think that we have a lot of thing of ways to easily regulate the issues that we do have um, while still allowing these businesses to thrive and not be um, hidden away. So I do think they, they serve a really um, important role in our city and um, for me are a good reminder of um, that there's other folks in Palm Springs and not just fancy restaurants that are downtown. Thank you. Any other comments from anyone? All right. Then uh, you have the direction. Very good. All right. Then we, uh, it's time to move on to city council. City manager requests an upcoming agenda development. Thank you, Mayor Council. We'll go ahead and put up the upcoming agenda, uh, tentative agenda. For December 5th, our next council meeting, and we have an update from Riverside County Transportation Commission on the CV Rail Project, Dream Hotel Amendment, Airport Concession Agreement, Building Code Update, First Reading, Surplus Property Disposition Resolution, and a Diversity Policy for City Boards, Commissions, and Committees. Uh, we also have the tax agreement with the uh, tribe, that, so that comes to probably almost five hours, four and a half hours. Um, so a full a full agenda, and then coming on the 15th, we move into uh, the new council member swearing in. Thank you. Items. Council member Kors. Uh Sure, I know, I think, is City Attorney Ballinger still on? Yes, indeed. Welcome back. <laughs> nice tree, by the way. Um, <laughs> I know we've been working on sort of two minor items. I don't know if you're planning on bringing those on the fifth. One was on um, some minor mo changes to the ethics, right, for people um, who are on, who are 700 filers. Um, I think is right, the people who have to recu recuse themselves if you have a nonprofit yep, interest, the changes we asked for. And then on the request that was made relating when we're talking about vacation rentals, since we're doing boards and commissions on um, council and the public being notified of final actions by a board or commission that give us enough time to call them up. Were those going to come yes, on the I, 5th? Yes, I have the ordinance okay. and staff report uh, done for the public integrity ordinance amendment. Uh, and I expect that I can get the other one done uh, in time for the agenda publishing for boards and commissions. I will point out... Um, uh, the tribal uh, sales tax agreement, that may be something that can be done by consent if we want to be a little bit more efficient. I, um, I don't see it as, it, certainly from a legal perspective, it does not need to be, uh, you know, business or legislative. Uh, thank you. And then one um, just quick um, update. So at um, Visit Greater Palm Springs at our last meeting, a week ago, we had uh, a report from um, the DEI consultant that has been hired, um, which was just amazing, right? And to see the work that has been going on at Visit Greater Palm Springs um, with a staff person who's focused at least a good part of her time on those issues. And I know we talked in the budget that that was a position we'd like to see here, and um, but I think it would be really helpful. Uh, I'll get the report. Maybe we can just share it with uh, council. Um, I want to share it with uh, you as well to really think about, you know, it was say, as we did with climate and the environment, we wanted that to permeate everything. But if we don't have someone in charge of it, um, it really doesn't seem to happen. So having sat through sort of this meeting and the presentation and seeing what's happening 
really in a matter of six months, I think, there, with that focused intentionality on it, I think it would be really um, important for the city to consider doing that, you know, having someone at least dedicated a portion of their time to it and maybe bringing in someone who works with municipalities on how to do a better job on DEI. Uh, so I will, um, I will get that to you uh, for the city manager. Uh, but uh, there's a lot, right, we can do. I think everyone wants to do it, but I don't think it, as you know, if we don't have someone taking the lead on the staff level, it just isn't going to happen at the level I think we, the council wants to see it and the community wants to see it. So I wanted to share that. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. If I could add, um, the Mayor Pro Tem and I uh, both had an opportunity uh, in the last two weeks to attend the National League and Cities Conference in Kansas City. Uh, very, very strong conference, particularly uh, many speakers uh, talking about uh, diversity uh, issues and uh, most profoundly uh, talking about issues of individuals that are at substantial risk uh, among the youth and ways to uh, to move forward. So uh, very pleased to be able to do that. It did remind me, though, uh, we travel uh, and need to travel frequently. Uh, but our processes here are a little different than what uh, I'm used to uh, with uh, another organization, CalPERS, where whenever uh, we are going to be traveling out of, uh, out of our area, uh, you need to file a travel request in advance. Uh, and that travel request and the cost of it is made known to the entire body through uh, being on a consent uh, calendar, usually consent calendar item, but it's made known to the public. So uh, I would like to see staff come back uh, at the future uh, date and provide us with uh, a uh, change in processes so that any travel that we are going to be taking that's going to be uh, reimbursed from the city is made known in advance unless there's an emergency. Uh, so that uh, it is uh, something that all members of council are aware of. Uh, and in doing that, I believe we should identify all of the travel that any of us has taken that's been reimbursed by the city over the course of the last, uh, uh, at least last year, if not last two years. Council member Course. Um, I think that makes sense, and I remember it must have just been my first year or two, though. You know, we used to, when we did council member comments um, before, but get short reports from people who did travel. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the council and the public has some benefit of, of that. And if there are reports that, you know, you, garner, you, you got there, that it gets shared with council and, and you know, in the public record. So, so there's the benefit for everyone from, from that travel, I think, could be really helpful. Um, Council Member Kors, that's actually a legal requirement under AB 1234 for those reports, so we should be doing those. Yeah, well, even more so then. Maybe that's why we were doing them back then. Um, and the other thing, we probably should do the same just for that, for you, council discretionary funds, because I've been asked several times, like, what do those go for? And, you know, they're being used for fellows and interns and, you know, or going to something, you know, that you need to go to. Um, but just so the public knows that it's not just, you know, some people have called it a slush fund, and it's not. But I think it would be helpful to do that for this past year and moving forward as well, just to share it on consent. You know, what, what that money goes for, because it goes for the community. Uh, and I think it's important that, you know, we always want to be transparent on that. We have the deal, though, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Council Member Woods? Uh, certainly. Um, I see we talked about... Um, um, exp I see what's not on the agenda um, before we end our term was... Um, expanding the opportunities for traffic calming. Um, and I had met with the engineering department about that. Um, that's not gonna be on the agenda, it looks like at this point. I would like that not to be dropped. I think it's very important. Our uh, traffic calming ordinance is, um, and staff I think agrees, is a little out of date. Uh, the pictures don't really relate to what we have here in the desert. So if we're not going to get it under my term, I'd like to see basically that continued into the next, which I think 
they want to do. Um, the other thing that's not on the agenda is bus stops. Um, I think we need to stand, it, it, it's not on the agenda. I, again, don't want it to go. It's been asked for, for quite a bit of time. And I think we need to standardize the amenity package that goes into bus stops and ensure that bus stops can be moved as build out happens and transit stops move and how we're currently building our bus stops doesn't provide the full amenity package and they're not allowed, they're built in such a way that we can't just up and move them like the ones that, are, um, that Sunline has actually specified. So I just don't want those to be forgotten by the future council, thank you. Anything else? All right. Then uh, with that, we are to adjournment at uh, 1056. The next regular city council meeting will be held on December 5, 2022 at 530 p.m. Uh, please be safe out there.